I now call the September 13th meeting of the Kansas State Board of Education to order. Welcome to those in attendance in the room and everyone watching online. All board members are here, seated, present. We don't need to approve the agenda today because we did that yesterday. So I will welcome Dr. Jay Scott. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, Dr. Watson, the board. Good morning. It's it's a little different being on the morning, uh, on Wednesday morning, start off start off your day. Um, so what I have to start off with are the most recent recommendations from the ARC, right, in terms of accreditation. Uh, we have 12 systems for action today and then five for receive. And by the end of this session, we will have gone through all, the board will have received all 179 systems that were up for accreditation this year. So Yes, we're into our next school year, but uh, we're, we're coming, we can kind of see the, the uh, light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Um, so by the end of this session, all 179 will have been received at least by the state board. Um, following this session, and this is long overdue, but following this session, we'll have a short ARC recognition uh, time where the ARC will join us online, as many as can, can join us, and we'll just talk about talk them up uh, just talk about their praise you know praise their work and and do all those things so that'll be directly after this this session you know as I was listening to Dr. Watson talk yesterday about the accountability report and the questions from the board I was just really interested in in your responses to the accountability report and all those things and I really honed in on M Michelle's comment about checking for understanding in the classroom formative assessment right and and if kids raise their hand, they know it, and then that we can move on, right? I think that's such a critical piece in any lesson plan is that checking for understanding along the way. You know, you can have a great lesson plan, but if you don't have really robust ways to check and, and see if the students actually understand it in the moment, it can really be ineffective, right? You, you, you can feel kind of lost as to where the students are. So knowing that and knowing that Dr. Watson really likes to quiz this group, I thought, what better way to start off a Wednesday board meeting with a KISA quiz? So here we go. Um, and in true checking for understanding fashion, the way to not do it is to ask for people to raise their hands and answer, but that's what we're going to do today. <laughs> okay, so um, if you know the answer, raise your hand and let's see what you got. So the first question is, what year did the KISA cycle, what school year did the KISA cycle begin? <laughs> Danny's out. Danny's out. We got one. Yeah. No, I, yeah, Randy, you're, you, yeah, we're going to mute you for this whole time. 2018-2019 is close, but no cigar. 2017 and... What's the school year, 2017, 2018? Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. We have a winner. Yes, yes. You go to the front of the line for lunch today. Yes, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's your. So um, the second question is very important. Do we accredit systems or do we accredit buildings in Kansas and Kisa and Ma? We accredit systems. Did you say that? I didn't even actually hear you say that. I guess I gave you credit for you were eating. Okay, so <laughs> systems. We credit at the system level. Before it had been at the building level, and we moved to system level for for uh, for Kisa. When we moved to systems, it was seventeen eighteen. Yes, seventeen eighteen. Seventeen eighteen. Um, I'm going to speed through this next one. So we had a five year cycle, right? Five year cycle. And I'd like to pose this question to the board. It was a five-year cycle, but systems, did they all go through the same five-year cycle, or were they allowed to choose the year they entered into KISA? They were allowed to enter in, which meant that in 1718, we actually had some systems that were in their accreditation year. I think we had a handful of systems that said, okay, it's 1718, but we're in year five. We're going to go through this year. So that 
led to this big disparity in the numbers of systems going through each year because they were allowed to choose. So all the systems that are going that went through this year, they chose to start in 1718 in year one. So to this point though, out of the 361 systems seeking accreditation uh, through KISA, 345 have completed the first cycle. That includes all the way up to today. Uh, we had 179 systems, nearly, you know, roughly 40, 45% of the systems total in the state went through this year. They chose this year to be their accreditation year. And so they're completing their first cycle um, during this school year. We do have 17 yet, and those are the 12 for action and the five for receive that you'll see today. So today is a conclusion of sorts to that, to that first cycle. And currently in Kansas, we have 300, oh, I'm sorry, 362 systems uh, that are seeking, uh, that are in KISA, 286 public and 76 private systems. Again, private systems have the option. They choose to go through KISA or they can go through some other accrediting organization. Well, good job on the quiz. And okay, we had a good start. Now, we're not done yet. But I'm not going to quiz you on the responsibilities here. We'll move through some of this. The system itself, the school district, the system, documents their process. They account for their results. We talked about um, a lot about how it's important that we understand what accreditation means, and it really comes down to that process that they have in place, that the premise is that you have a good process that leads to good results. The outside visitation team has been that external collaborator. They make a report to the Accreditation Review Council, as does the system. The Accreditation Review Council, the group that makes the recommendations to the State Board, the group will recognize after this session uh, this morning. They really look at the, the accountability report, as Dr. Watson talked about yesterday. They look at that accountability report. They look at the reports from the OVT and the system, and they make a recommendation of accreditation to the State Board. And then this body actually makes that final determination. So this is the current process that systems go through. It starts with data analysis. They, what are their needs? They set goals. They select strategies that leverage those goals. And we talked about the term leverage yesterday. Uh, we imp they implement those strategies, and then they analyze the effect of those strategies. And a lot of what Dr. Proctor talked about yesterday can be seen in those fundamentals. A lot of that can be seen in this process. Um, so systems really had years one through four. They have that yearly visit from the OVT. Um, they put together yearly system reports. The OVT chair puts together yearly reports. That all goes in years one through four. And then in year five, that's when that's what we call their accreditation year. They go through the process and go before the ARC and come before the board. Okay, second layer of the quiz. Who can tell me what it means to be accredited in Kansas? If you're a K-12 system in Kansas going through KISA, what does it mean if you're accredited? You have shown what? Yes. There is a compliance piece to it, yes. That's one. You got partial credit, yes. Must follow the law, must be in compliance. I have done a poor job teaching this group for the last, I don't know how many months I've been up in front of this group. So I just thought, you know, I'll just uh, quiz them today. <laughs> well, there's two pieces of evidence that systems must show to be accredited. They've shown conclusive evidence in process and conclusive evidence of student results. Ann Ma. So I don't know who the winner is, but you all have done very well. I think Ann's probably on the, on the leaderboard. So evidence of student success and a quality process, they have to show both. And the ones that you'll see today that are conditionally accredited, what does that mean? So We'll talk about that next, but if they're fully accredited, they've shown evidence of both. They've got a quality process in place, and they're showing evidence of student performance increasing. 
and it must be in compliance. Okay, how about conditionally accredited? One of those two is in place, right? Over the process and results, correct? They have a quality process in place, but they're not showing the student results or vice versa. Here's the trick question for today. Can you be out of compliance and be conditionally accredited? That is correct. You must still be in compliance to be conditionally accredited because you are technically still accredited in Kansas. You're just, you have conditions, and those conditions relate to either the process gaps that you have or the student results gaps that you have. You still must be in compliance, though. Jay, give, give yeah. the board an example of what would be a law or compliance. The, um, one of the more recent compliance metrics is the dyslexia training, right? Schools must assess their students, I think it's three times a year. They have to provide and, and do a dyslexia assessment three times a year. That is a compliance. That's, that's a law that students or that schools and systems must comply with. So here at KSDE, we have these compliance leads. Lori Curtis oversees dyslexia. So she ensures that systems are complying with that. If they're not, then Lori communicates with the accreditation team and we can work through that with the system. Just because they may not do it in one year, right, doesn't necessarily mean they're not in compliance. We're going to work with them, so they might be working towards compliance. But that's an example of if you are not doing something that's legislated, that's a law, that that could impact your accreditation. You could be not accredited. Yes. Are private schools required to uh, comply just like the public schools are, like with the dyslexia? Yes. I mean, if they're going to be accredited, but if they're not working toward accreditation, it doesn't apply to them, does it? You're going to love this answer. It depends <laughs> because, um, because private systems are not funded by the state, any funded compliance areas like special education, they would not be held accountable to those. But the one I use, the dyslexia training, they are, they must comply with that. So some of the compliance areas apply to private systems. Some that are more funding based do not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mark Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just a quick question on just a quick question on the since we had gone so long where we had so many parents that were complaining about, you know, the d dyslexia with the with their children and being left behind. Uh, they went out and had their own diagnosis, they had their own interventions. So we're doing that in the schools now. Now they're mm -hmm. not the schools not being doctor named if the if the parents are doing their own intervention and their own process and their own tutoring and don't want to have the assessment done by the school because it's they've already got it in place and they're doing it outside because they've been. I'm just thinking of a lot of parents in a, in one district. They're mm -hmm. they're they've gone and spent the money and doing their own thing and, and it's working for their child. They don't want to have setbacks or something different after they already. So I'm just making sure that. I know that it's a system, and I know that they are supposed to be assessing these kids, but there are some parents that are going to opt out of that because they've already, they've already gone and done their own thing and spent their money, and they don't want to have something come along and do something different than what they're doing. So just making sure that the parent, if a lot of parents opt out of that or assessing or whatever, they, they, the, that, that system isn't ding for that. They're offering it, but they don't have to accept that. I just want to make sure that that is... <coughs> But that's not going to come back and haunt some of these parents that have already made, made a lot of progress with their kid, and now we're going back and you're saying, well, we might miss some, so it's good to assess everybody. There's going to be some that are going to say, nope, I've already, I've already spent the money and we're doing it this way and we have our own tutoring sessions after school or whatever it is. We don't want it, anything changing. Showing them a different way, maybe that teacher's not 
doing it the right way or whatever, you know, because they're still learning. We're still teaching all these teachers to go back in the phonics and stuff. So I just want to make sure. So I can follow up with Lori Curtis because she would have more working knowledge of that. It doesn't take very long for me to get out of my element in these situations. So there are 16 or 17 different compliance areas. Each have different intricacies to that compliance area. What we have done is over the last year, we've pulled together into one document all the compliance areas and listed this is what it looks like to be in compliance to be working towards compliance or not in compliance we didn't have that before this year we think that's really going to be helpful i'm not sure that that document gets down to your question but i'll, I'll follow up with Lori and make sure she she contacts you and so kind of like we talked about that. yesterday it's still parent authority the parent can still opt out of that assessment um, if they feel like what they, they've got a handle on it and they feel very strongly about their child's uh, reading level and, and, and they're happy with that, the school, the system just keeps doing what it's doing for, uh, and catching the kids maybe that, that haven't, been, you know, haven't been assessed before, but the parents that are already working towards that, I just wanted to make yes. sure we're not, we're not messing with, with that at, at the local level. Michelle, you're, you. you're correct. A parent can opt out of any assessment. Yeah. All right, thank you. We've got a couple more questions, but I'm going to let you sure. finish this slide because I think you okay. may answer some questions. As you you guys want to get out of the quiz. I, I, can, I can feel <laughs> it now. So not accredited. What does it mean to be not accredited? So we know we've got, it's based on three things, right? Process, results, and compliance. So out of those three, how would we define not accredited. Ann's got it. So insufficient evidence, both of process and student results, or by itself, not in compliance. So those are the, the three definitions, the working definitions for this first cycle of KISA. Um, and as you listen to and you take action on systems, just realize that that's really where those, what we, when we say accredited, conditionally accredited, not accredited, that's what those mean. So these were the 12 systems that the board received in August, and these are slated for action today. I will read these off, um, and um, if you have any questions before you vote, that's fine. We'll go ahead and jump right in. So you had the executive summary for each of these systems last month to review. Um, 329 Wabunsee, um, Moore Hill Mount Academy, Most Pure Heart of Mary Elementary, and Good Shepherd School all being recommended for full accreditation. 216 Deerfield, 261 Hayesville, 314 Brewster, 334 Southern Cloud, and 369 Burton all being recommended by the ARC <clears throat> for conditional accreditation. And then 403, Otis Bison, USD 500, Kansas City, Kansas, and then Life Prep Academy, all being uh, recommended for conditionally accredited. Now we have a few questions. Ann. Danny? Thank you. Can we, can we, is there a place I can go look for the 16 or 17 compliance areas, or can I get a copy There's of a, all those? Yes, we can make sure you have the, a, okay. that document. It's on our web page. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. I don't see any more questions. Okay. I'd like to just say this. I think Jay said it. A whole purpose of accreditation is is to work with school districts, not to have them fail. So um, if someone's not in compliance, like uh, none of your teachers are accredited or we haven't done the dyslexia training, generally there's a soft reach out to the district that says you need to correct this. If we would happen to get, we're not going to do it. Then they get a pretty stern letter from me saying, if you don't correct this by this date, we will bring a recommendation not to accredit you. It's fairly rare because we want to be in a partnership. But I want you to know we're not trying. I think sometimes people think we want to do a gotcha system. So 
we, we don't want to do a gotcha. We want to really work to improve that. And that's why, you know, I, I've talked about the takeover of Houston down in Texas or, you know, Kansas City, Missouri <coughs> decades ago. If we get to the place where we have a not accredited school district, we have all somewhat failed in that process of trying to really uh, do that well. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. Thank you, Commissioner. At this time, a motion would be in order if there are no other questions. Dana? I move that the Kent State Board of Education accept the recommendations of the Accreditation Review Council and award the status as recommended by the ARC as presented. Jim, was that a second? Yes. Second from Jim Porter. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? It's 9-1, Michaela. Motion passes. Thank you. So these are the five systems for receive that will be voted on by the, by the board um, next month. So 499 Galena being recommended for full accreditation. <clears throat> St. John's Lutheran Elementary being recommended for full accreditation. 462 Central of Burden is being recommended for conditional accreditation. And Christ the King in Kansas City has also been recommended for conditional accreditation. And then Urban Preparatory Academy <clears throat> is being recommended by the ARC for, as being not accredited. So to, to Randy's point, um, I provided the document, the, the timeline of the work that we've done with Urban Prep since they initially wanted to join KISA, which officially was in the spring of 2020, right in the midst of the, the pandemic. Um, so you can see that timeline and see all the, the supports and, and efforts that we made um, in trying to help Urban Preparatory gain that uh, accredited status that they were seeking. So um, again, that's a receive item. You have that in your packet to look through. And, and if you have any questions between now and the next board meeting, please feel free to reach out. Um, happy to talk through any of this with you. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, you all did wonderful. Uh, some of you didn't raise your hands at all, so I'm wondering if, if, you, um, if you're even, yes, awake this morning. No. Um, <laughs> that's after the board session today. Um, okay. Opted out of the assessment. I should have been prepared for that from you, Jim. I didn't see a parent request from Mr. Porter's uh, parents to opt him out. So. Okay, so I am very excited about this next portion of the meeting. Um, as, as Myron and I and Sarah and Amber have, have been meeting with the ARC over the course of the last several years, um, and they are popping in. Just looking bright and cheery this morning. Let me pull up the, I'll try to do this. Eric, if I'm screwing something up, let me know. Is that good? There we go. Talk about remedial. Okay, um, Curtis Nightingale, can you, can you hear me? Okay, awesome. Thank you, Curtis. So um, this is the Accreditation Review Council. This is the group that for the last six years has reviewed 362 systems for accreditation in Kansas. Um, it, it's, oops, let me go back. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Curtis. I did not want to hear that much. La I want to hear me again, for sure. So um, we wanted to take a time to celebrate the work of the ARC. Uh, this has been such an honor to work alongside such a dedicated group of professionals, um, past and present. Uh, we don't have everybody on screen today. The schedules didn't just match up like that. They're all across the state, all in different positions. Um, I wish we'd had more time to interact. 
but we really wanted to take the time as we wrap up this this first cycle of Kisa to to let the the board recognize the the great work of the ARC. Um, so we're pleased to present the ARC today. Uh, again, they've they've gone through and, and reviewed every one of our 362 systems seeking accreditation. It's an incredible accomplishment when you think about the depth and the breadth of each of those reviews. It's, it's really amazing to think about that. They've gone through their work in such a professional and just with great fortitude, really forged on through some tough times. Think about the pandemic and you think about um, the, the large volume of systems coming through, especially this year. It's really been a, a great learning experience. And what I take home with me from this group is they are not only are they leaders in their own schools, their own organizations, but they're leaders in the state trying to set up quality learning experiences for our kids. It's the most important aspect. So such important work. Um, these are our retirements. Um, I don't think they're CAPERS eligible, but they are. They're retiring from the ARC. They have termed out. They, these are uh, six individuals who, from the start, have been part of the ARC. Uh, we rely on this group heavily. Uh, I just think about what they've learned, where they started. They were here for the inception of KISA, which was a huge shift in Kansas. And they have been all along. They've stayed on. And they had the option to jump off after three years. So they stayed on, very committed. Um, so we can't, we can't uh, thank and, uh, these six individuals enough. Just very grateful for their service. Um, and so we're, we're very excited to, to uh, as they wrap up this year, I'm sure they're very excited to be, to be moving on to something else. But we have really relied on this group for the historical perspective and really bringing and grounding the group several times when we've kind of been at times uh, trying to find our way. So just incredible leadership from this group. So yes, yes, absolutely. Um, these two individuals started last year with us, and just due to some unforeseen circumstances, they have to jump off the arc. Um, but just wonderful. You know, Myron, last year, uh, well, two years ago, we were down to 10 members on the arc. A full arc is 18. And so we were really down. And we knew with that many systems coming through, I mean, for the last year and a half, we've gotten through 271 of the 361 systems. So just in the last year and a half, that's what this group has done. So we knew we needed a full arc, and Myron did a phenomenal job of going out and finding and recruiting and cajoling uh, people onto the arc. And they've just been wonderful, and Julian and Casey exemplify that. And then we have our returners. So you know how they have the little synopsis about the returning starters. We're super excited about having this group returning on the ARC because we're really going to have to lean on them, as you all know, as we reimagine, re-envision, and improve KISA accreditation. They are going to be those people that have that historical perspective but also can help us really reimagine what accreditation needs to look like to, again, set up quality student learning experiences in every classroom. So these members are staying on. Uh, we are not going to ask them if they've changed their mind. We're just going to continue down. I'm just kidding. They are so committed um, and, and very, very professional in, in how they approach everything. So that's, the, that's our recognition. Um, but I just didn't, I, I wanted a, a chance for the, for the um, and, and I'm used to seeing them on Zoom. I, I, I don't even know if I've ever seen <clears throat> some of these people in person. Um, but it, it's just great to see them uh, and, and have some time for, for, the, for the board to recognize their great efforts. Can, can we just get around, I mean, 179 <laughs> systems in one year. Like, congratulations. Yeah. And thank you so much to all of you for the work that you do. And again, Madam Chair, Jay, remind the board how much they're compensated. Well, <clears throat> good question. Um, these are for the uh, for our retirees. <clears throat> they're gonna. I don't know if they're gonna appreciate this or not. But when it started, 
they were not, it was completely volunteer, completely volunteer. Um, but due to Jeanette Nobo's leadership, we were able to provide some compensation in the last three years, I think. Um, Curtis asked for back pay, but we, we went ahead and said no on that one. But um, they largely, it's, they're vastly underpaid, right, for the time and effort they put into. We try to set a parameter of, okay, about, because each one starts with an individual review. And we, we put that at about two hours. And I can tell you right now, that's not, they did not, they spent a lot more time than two hours. So we need to probably increase that compensation um, for sure. But um, largely, I think this group, you know, they're not doing it for, for that. They're doing it for the right reasons. And, and uh, we just appreciate their, their efforts with that. And these individuals come from diverse backgrounds. They're not all KSDE employees, correct? But none of them are KSDE employees. Um, <clears throat> and so um, now Sarah is, but Sarah's part of our team. Uh, and But they are higher ed, uh, district leaders. We've got principals. We've got special education. We've got a whole um, list of positions that we're looking for. Uh, Myron does a great job of monitoring that, making sure we've got a good cross-section. We also want to make sure we get region, regional representation uh, aligned with the board. So th there's a lot of time and effort that goes into this that you probably don't see. Um, and again, Myron's done a phenomenal job just working with this group and really making sure we've got the right people in the right places. And so if someone out there is listening and they're thinking, this is something I'd be interested in, they should Maybe. reach out to Myron. Myron's nodding thanks his for, head. Thanks for teeing that up. So we, we've, <laughs> we've been putting that in the, uh, I think, the weekly for quite a while. Um, I know Sarah's been, been, that's on repeat. So, but yes, we would love to do that. Our first meeting, official meeting of the, the new ARC will be in November. So we're actively recruiting people to be on the ARC. So if you know of someone, uh, we'll make sure that you have that and that the information that you need to go out. The Accreditation Advisory Council, the group that's our complete advisory, they actually approve people to be on the ARC. So if you recommend somebody to us, we'll take them to the AAC and then they will say, yes, uh, this person can serve in that role. Anything Public else? Public and private members. Public and private members, absolutely. We try to get a good cross-section, uh, very important, so. Board members, any questions or comments for Jay or for anyone on the screen? Jim? <clears throat> We've recognized a lot of people you know, who have made this uh, effort over the past what, five years, Jay? Se actually, about seven years <laughs> when we started. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to recognize Jay and his leadership and what he's done to make this work. Uh, we can say from our board table that we want something to happen. They can come from the department and say, we'd like to do this. I don't know if Jay was realizing he was getting a job when he said, let's do it, when he led us on the, the team to uh, create the ARC. But, uh, Jay, you've done a great job bringing this all together and representing the state of Kansas very well. Kids are doing better in school because of your efforts and that of the ARC. So thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Jim. Yes, I want to thank you all, too, for I know how difficult this is and how much time you did, and I want to make sure that, that we uh, express our appreciation statement in a question. How, are we making any effort to uh, balance the load of the ARC going forward? Yes, we are. That's a, that's a major. We're actually, you know, they're, they're not just meeting with the board today. We're actually going to meet as soon as we're done here. We're going to talk about the next iteration of accreditation, and that is a major piece that we need to make sure that we are, in, in some ways we've said we've, equalize the number of systems, but I, I, there are other ways to, to make sure that we're working in a fashion that meets systems where they are, as opposed to waiting until year five and then addressing issues that may have been there for, for a few years. So, and this group will really drive that, that process. Dina. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would, 
offer my kudos to the ARC and to you as well because um, for several years I've had the opportunity to um, judge the teachers of the year and I know how much time that takes and it's a very small uh, component to what each one of these folks have done. So um, I respect the kind of time that you had put in and appreciate very much your work. But I wondered you were asking us for if we knew anyone, but we don't know the categories that you're right. looking for. So if you could provide that too, perhaps in our notes, that would be helpful. Thank sure. you. You bet, thank you. Well, I just wanna say thank you again to everyone on the screen. Thank you, Jay, thank you, Myron, thank you, Sarah, your whole department. You guys are doing a, a heavy lift and there's interesting work to come ahead. So appreciate all that you're doing. I think these folks deserve a standing ovation. Thank really you. do. Thank you, Thank you all. You. We could stand in front of a monitor and take a picture, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, a Zoom photo. <laughs> I, I, and I just, you know, Melanie and Jim, thank you for the kind words and the, the whole board for the support, but it's right back at you. It's, it's the reason that we're doing this work is at the leadership of the board. So thank you so much for, for all you've done and appreciate the time today. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye. And yes, if they were here, we would take a photo for sure next time. <laughs> Um, next up, item is the item number is seven, a uh, learning series, Kansas Volunteer Commission. I want to welcome Jessica Dorsey. There you are. Can't see behind those columns, so I never know who's in the room. I just cross my fingers and hope that when I say your name, you come forward. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. All right. Well, hi. Good morning. My name is Dr. Jessica Dorsey, and I am with the Kansas Volunteer Commission, which is a program of the Kansas State Department of Education. It has been a long minute since I've had an opportunity to present to the State Board, so I am really excited to be here today. Um, just a little bit about me. I've been with the agency for 13 years, and I first came over as a graduation, high school dropout prevention, charter virtual alternative school consultant. I've also spent some time with school accreditation. I've also spent some time with school improvement, local consolidated plans, and one really long semester with accreditation of institutions of higher education. Super thankful for Dr. Schmidling uh, taking that work on. But for the last seven years, I've had the distinct pleasure of leading the Kansas Volunteer Commission, which is a hidden gem here at the Kansas State Department of Education. I live in Osage City, and my husband and I have a blended family of seven children together. So we are all the time busy out at sporting events and school events. Um, we lead a sports recycling program in our community, and we really foster this love of service to others with our children. And I imagine that that love of service is something that really resonates with you as well. Because just like the Accreditation Review Council, I doubt you're here for the money, right? You're here because you have a passion for children, you have a desire to make sure that our schools are operating appropriately, that we're teaching students the right things, that we're preparing our teachers in the right ways. And that is exactly what the Kansas Volunteer Commission is all about, is fostering that love of service to others and civic engagement across the state. That was a really long introduction, so thanks for sticking with me. So at the Kansas Volunteer Commission, our vision really is to empower Kansans to meet their local community needs through service. We serve as a state service commission, in 1990, with the community 1993 rather, with the Community Service and National Service Trust Act, they established state service commissions in every state across the nation and many territories as well. And this is the way that our federal AmeriCorps dollars flow down into our state and then out into our communities. Um, 
we, our primary role is to serve as a hub for volunteer mentor and civically engaged organizations, which can include schools and local government. Um, we provide them training, technical assistance, and resources to make sure that they have what they need in order to better develop volunteers, mentors, AmeriCorps National Service members, and otherwise civically engaged citizens across the state. Okay, let's make sure I did that. So every two years, they publish the Civic and Volunteering Life in America report, and I'm proud to share that Kansas is ranked number eighth informal uh, volunteering among all the other states in the nation. So it's really great that we have such a pride for volunteerism and taking care of our neighbors um, in our state, and that's being recognized nationally. We are led by a group of governor-appointed commissioners. Because we are um, a, a state service commission, our bylaws require us to have a nonpartisan group of individuals who have been appointed by the governor who help lead our work forward. We have about 15 commissioners um, in the state right now, including uh, Melanie Haas. And we are led by Amy Pinger, who's our chair, and she's with Harvesters um, Community Food Network. And our vice chair is Ginger Williams, who's with Optum um, Incorporated. And these commissioners are really vital to us. They um, help us make sure that we're on the right track and that we're doing things appropriately. So they're sort of an intermediary from you. Um, everything that we bring to you all in terms of a board vote, we take to our commission first, and then we bring to you second. So they're sort of vetting out all of the work that we're doing um, before it elevates up to you. As I mentioned, we were established in 1993 as part of that Community Service and National, National and Community Service Trust Act. We, for a long time, were known as the Kansas Commission on National and Community Service, and in 2003, our name was formally changed to the Kansas Volunteer Commission. We've been with the State Department of Education for a very long time, at least 20 years, I would say, although the record keeping about when that actually happened 2000, 2001, 2002, it's a little iffy. Before that, the Kansas Volunteer Commission um, was at a variety of different places, some private partnerships and some um, public partnerships in the state. I think we were at West Star for a couple of years, and then ultimately um, we ended up here at the Kansas State Department of Education. And we have a very strong education and youth focus, which I think makes us a strong ally to be here in the State Department. We've also heard from other counterparts across the nation that they, when they are placed in state agencies that are part of the governor's cabinet, that they change when the governors come and go. The, the staffing changes, their priorities change, and we've been really lucky here in the State Department of Education to have a greater level of stability with our programming. We are, in fact, celebrating our 30-year anniversary this year, and so it's exciting um, to acknowledge all that we've done so far in Kansas. Our commission funding priorities are not set by the commission, they're not set by the State Department of Education, but rather, as part of those federal bylaws, we are required to do a, a statewide survey, collect information from a wide variety of constituents across the state, and then use that information to make decisions about our funding priorities. So we did that back in 2021. We did a statewide survey that went out all across the state. We, we put a lot of time and energy to make sure that we had all of the underrepresented voices um, present in our survey. And in fact, across the nation, we had one of the highest response rates with over 1,200 people responding to that survey, letting us know um, how important volunteerism was for them, the challenges that they're experiencing, the highlights that they're experiencing, and also telling us what their funding priorities were. And so when it came down, um, we have narrowed it to these five areas. Um, and our main two focus areas that we are always trying to hit is youth development and mentoring and education. Again, tying that focus right back into the State Department of Education. We're also funding initiatives that are addressing um, various determinants of poverty, uh, making sure that we're getting money into our rural communities and addressing social justice issues as well. 
annually we receive approximately $3.4 million in funding from AmeriCorps, that's our federal funder, and I'm proud to say that 87% of those dollars is flowing right back out into our communities all across the state through our various AmeriCorps grants, our Volunteer Generation Fund grants, and also we have a seven-part mini-grant series that has been very effective as well. We do retain the other 13%. It helps pay for some of our overhead costs, like office space and phones, computers. It pays the salary, not only for myself, but the other six staff members that we have in the Kansas Volunteer Commission. And it's also helping to pay for a lot of the training and technical assistance that we're delivering across the state as well. And I'll dive into all of that here in a little bit. So as I mentioned, AmeriCorps is our federal funder. They were formerly known as the Corporation for National and Community Service. They did a rebrand a few years ago and now um, known as AmeriCorps. But they are the federal organization that's dedicated um, to improving lives, strengthening communities, and fostering civic engagement through service and volunteerism. And so we hold really tightly to that mission as well, and it sort of helps um, align the work that we're doing to the work that they are doing also. So I like to say that there are really like four different types of programming that we're offering at the State um, Volunteer Commission. And one of those is AmeriCorps. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of AmeriCorps before. Good, some people, that's fantastic. So I like to say that AmeriCorps is the domestic version of the Peace Corps. A lot of us know what the Peace Corps is because it's been around for a lot longer and it's a lot flashier, right? You get to travel to exotic places. Um, but AmeriCorps can be just as flashy, right? You could be a service member all the way in Wichita, right? So um, we have over 200 AmeriCorps members who are serving across our state to help make their communities um, better, healthier, and safer places to live. We have currently 11 operational AmeriCorps programs. We also do have two planning grants, so they are exploring whether or not AmeriCorps could be a solution for them. But each of these organizations commits um, to address whatever their community need is by applying AmeriCorps members as the intervention. So in, uh, in other grant opportunities, you might get dollars to deliver an intervention. In AmeriCorps, you're receiving dollars to pay a modest, and I say that with all sincerity, a very modest living allowance to members who will deliver the intervention. So like at the Boys and Girls Club of Lawrence in Manhattan, these members are serving in our schools during the school day, providing additional academic support to students, and then reconnecting with those students in the after school program to provide them even additional academic support. And they have found um, time and time again that that level of intervention is actually helping the students to raise their reading and math scores. We also are funding um, Center for Supportive Communities, which is in Lawrence. This is a truancy prevention program, so addressing our chronic absenteeism across the state. Emporia State University is using our program to give teacher prep students additional opportunities in the classroom to address literacy in K through third grades. The Kansas Association for the Conservation and Environmental Education is using our dollars to expand conservation and environmental education across the state. Our Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks uses AmeriCorps members in most of the state parks across the state. They are improving the infrastructure, they are providing educational programming, and they are cleaning up after natural disasters. Uh, Kansas City Teacher Residency is actually now known as the Educator Academy, and I apologize for that mistake in the PowerPoint, um, but they are um, providing an alternative teacher prep program um, with our Kansas City, Kansas School District. USD 260 Derby is using AmeriCorps members to expand education, academic support programming, along with civic engagement. But what's really fantastic about Derby is that they are mostly recruiting high school students seniors to be the AmeriCorps members in the elementary grades. So now these high school students are receiving a very modest living allowance so they don't need to get an after school job. And also when they graduate, they're gonna finish with an education award. 
because AmeriCorps also provides an education award. So now our high school students are equipped, money in their pocket, and an education award to move on. The United Way of Caw Valley is here in Topeka serving Shawnee and Douglas, and I think also Jefferson County. And they are using the AmeriCorps program in a variety of social service settings. So placing AmeriCorps members sort of as case managers to help people navigate the social services that they might need in that area. Wichita State University is using AmeriCorps members to address educational opportunities with local nonprofits. So they place their AmeriCorps members at education focused programs in the Wichita area. And they've also recently just expanded this year to um, public health opportunities as well, which takes us to the very last one, if you're keeping track. Wyandotte County Public Health is, of course, using their AmeriCorps members to address public health issues in the Wyandotte County area. So we're really proud of our AmeriCorps programs. Many of them have been with us for a number of years. And some of them, four of them, are brand new um, to the program to the program this year, and we're really proud of the work that they're doing across the state. We're also really proud um, to support the KSDE Civic Engagement Initiative. Um, so we support this by collecting and scoring and awarding the Civic Advocacy Network Awards, which we just did last month, and that was very exciting. Uh, 10 schools across the state have now received the Civic Ad Advocacy Network Award which means that they are really committing um, to ensure that their students are having a wide variety of civic engagement opportunities during the school day. We also provide a monthly civic engagement webinar. So if you're free on Friday from noon to one and you're interested in hearing from some of these Civic Advocacy Network award winners, they will be doing a showcase and I'll send you that webinar link. We also have uh, another one of our pillars of programming is VGF, known as the Volunteer Generation Fund. Nearly all of the dollars that we receive from the federal government comes in the form of um, population-based funding, right? So we don't have to do anything special, we just receive it because of our population. The Volunteer Generation Fund is different because it is competitive. And I don't usually brag, but I'm going to take a minute right now and brag about the Volunteer Generation Fund because this year there were 183 applications that were received and they only funded 23 across the whole nation. And the Kansas Volunteer Commission received one. And I'm really proud of that because it also means that we have received the Volunteer Generation Fund grant consistently every single year since its inception. 12 years ago, and I don't think any other state can say that. Thank you, Melanie. <laughs> so we use that Volunteer Generation Fund dollars in a variety of ways. Um, so I'll talk about what we're currently doing, and on October 1, we switched to the new grant, and I'll tell you what we're gonna do with that grant as well. So right now, we're using this grant to award out some capacity building subgrants. So these are in the range of 15 to $20,000 that we have awarded to these six organizations to build the capacity of their volunteer program. As we know, it's not just enough to have a volunteer program. There's so much that goes into it, right? You have to recruit the volunteers. You have to train the volunteers. You have to onboard the volunteers. You monitor them. You recognize them. You retain them. Sometimes you let them go. Right? It's, a very, it's a very moving, evolving process, and it takes a lot of, of work and development to keep it going. With our VGF grant, we are also supporting something called the Service Enterprise Program. This is a nationally recognized program that says when an organization goes through the Service Enterprise change management process, they fundamentally shift the way that they think about volunteers so that they become a really integral way of them advancing their mission. Um, and when this happens, they're able to actually function like an organization that has a larger budget, even though they don't, because they're using volunteers in such a strategic, uh, purposeful way. So back in 2019, there were no service enterprise certified organizations in the state. The Kansas Volunteer Commission was certified in 2019. We were the first one. Then we went through the steps to become a hub ourselves. So now we are trained and we deliver this curriculum and training to other organizations across the state. And since that time, we've been really lucky to bring on an additional eight organizations that have been certified. 
Okay, so I'll pause here. With our new Volunteer Generation Fund grant, we will continue these two activities that we were doing before, but we're also expanding to a new area that is really fun and exciting. So we have heard from our schools that they would like to have more adults in the building. Like they want to be able to use volunteers and mentors in a greater way, but it's too much to think about, right? It's, it's, it's a, I just mentioned to you all the steps that have to take place. Where do you start? Where do you find people? How do you make sure that, they, that our children are gonna be safe? How do we make sure the volunteer opportunity is effective? So we are developing a school volunteer and mentor toolkit and training that will help our schools um, to be able to implement a volunteer or mentor program in their own building. This will be a full toolkit that will contain every sample template that they would need in order to get a program up and running. And we will take them through a day-long training on how to implement it and then coach them through the process for the rest of the semester. And we're hoping to roll this out in January of 2024. And it's something that we're really excited about. So if you have schools out there who might be interested in this, be sure you send them our way. We might have a question. Anne, did you oh. want to go now or you want to wait until the end? Okay. Okay. Our last pillar of programming, so if you're keeping track, we have AmeriCorps, Civic Engagement, Volunteer Generation Fund, and lastly, Youth Mentoring. So back in 2006, Governor Sebelius and Coach Bill Snyder uh, joined together on a venture to make sure that every child in the state has access to a mentor. And that initiative became known as Kansas Mentors. A few years back, we changed the, we had a, a shift in names and we changed it to Mentor Kansas. Um, and our goal is to ensure that every young Kansan is developing into a successful, productive, engaged adult, which really aligns very nicely with your definition of a successful high school graduate as well. So we support mentoring programs across the state in the same way that we support volunteer programs across the state. We provide training, we provide technical assistance, we provide resources. We have a mentoring partnership program that our mentoring programs across the state can um, apply to. It's no cost at all. They fill out the application and then we score on a rubric and they're placed into one of three levels. They can be a bronze partner, they can be a silver partner and a gold partner. I think we, we like our color structure here with the, with the stars and everything. And the whole goal is that our bronze partners have committed to a basic level of safety and effectiveness in their mentoring program. So we're making sure they have liability insurance. We're making sure that they're doing background checks on their um, mentors and their staff. And as you move up, so too does their commitment to safety and effectiveness standards. And as they move up, we incentivize them with uh, priority and grant funding. We give them special badges that they can put on their website. Um, we have, um, you know, what's the word? Um, small tokens that we can send them as well as appreciation. We'll give them letters of support for other grant funding that they may be seeking out. Um, but it's all really geared towards making sure that our mentoring programs are operating in the best way possible to keep our children safe. And this mentoring is not only for school-based mentoring, it's also for community-based mentoring and faith-based mentoring as well. So in addition to everything I just told you, we're also doing all of these things. So we have a three-part mini-series that we offer every year, uh, offer this year. Um, there is a mentoring webinar that's done once a month, a volunteer engagement webinar that's done once a month, and a civic engagement webinar that's done on that third Friday, which is this Friday. And these have been well attended. We save them, we put them on our YouTube channel so that other people can go back and learn from them as well. We also provide targeted training and technical assistance. Organizations often reach out to us with an issue that they're having. We're able to help support them through um, that by providing technical assistance. Sometimes we'll connect them with a training. Sometimes we'll deliver a training. We also um, help with certifications, not only the service enterprise certification that we talked about before, but also we will help individuals in the state to earn their certification in volunteer administration. Um, which is a, another really distinct um, sort of uh, 
privilege that not everyone earns. I believe we only have, we have less than 10 certified in volunteer administration individuals in our state. Two of them on our commission and one of them on our staff. So we're really um, grateful for that. We also provide grant funding, as I mentioned before, AmeriCorps dollars, the Volunteer Generation Fund dollars, and then our mini grant series that's coming up a slide from now. We host an annual conference on volunteerism. Um, this year, unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond our control, we had to postpone the conference that was planned in October. Um, but in lieu of that, now we're doing a leadership series uh, for our organizations across the state with the training workshops that will be done, one in October, one in November, one in December, always um, at no or limited cost. We support professional support groups, um, which is also down with the virtual networking. So we have a number of online networking groups, the Kansas Association of Volunteer Engagers. We have a mentoring group. Um, we have a group for our AmeriCorps programs where they're able to network with each other, ask questions, um, and see a variety of resources that we post out there. One of my very favorite things that we do every year is the Give Back Kansas Challenge. That's our corporate challenge. So for any of you that are working or running your own business, just keep this in your back pocket. Um, the Give Back Kansas Challenge really encourages employers to support volunteerism of their staff. And so this is a challenge that we've been running for a few years now. It was paused during the pandemic, but we brought it back last year. And different sized organizations across the state compete with one another to see who can have the most volunteer hours among their employees. And this was a very competitive competition this year. Um, and in the end, we were able to award out to the Wichita Festivals. Uh, they won in our medium group category and the um, city of Carbondale, Kansas, just, just down the road. Uh, they won in the small group category, and Cloud County Government won in the large group category. And so when they win, our partner, Volunteer Kansas, um, they provide each of the organizations with $1,000 to donate to a charity of their choice. So we have uh, competed in this as an agency three times now, and three times now we have not won the large group category. So. Uh, I, we're coming back this year. Um, but meanwhile, we did have just hundreds of hours of, of volunteer service that was um, contributed um, out and out of work time among our own employees. So it's a really great opportunity um, for them. And then, of course, we have opportunities to serve. So as I mentioned, that governor appointed um, commissioners, they're all volunteers. And so they're just individuals who have a passion uh, for the work that we are doing, and they want to serve, and so they serve. So some of you, I think, are retiring. So if you're looking for something to fill that, that void of service in your heart when you leave here, I hope that you'll seek us out. We also have a mentoring advisory council that is made up of mentoring professionals across the state. So if you know of a great mentoring program in your community, I hope you'll connect them with us as well. Okay, so I mentioned I would come back to our mini grant series. If you recall earlier, we talked about those five funding priorities, which are education, youth development and mentoring, social justice, rural communities, and poverty. And so we make sure that all of our mini grants that we're offering are aligned to one or more of those focus areas. So every year we put out the mini grant series and it's a staggered set of mini grants that go out throughout the year kicking off in January which is National Mentoring Month with the Mentoring Capacity Building Grant. And then we move into the Volunteer Manager Support Grant. This supports the professional development of volunteers and volunteer managers across the state. We have a Youth Civic Engagement Grant which funds youth-led and youth-initiated service projects in the state. We do social justice capacity building for nonprofit volunteer mentor organizations who need to grow their capacity around a social justice issue. The 9-11 Day of Service is one of my personal favorites because Flint Hills Volunteer Center requests these dollars every year to put on their annual 9-11 Remembrance event um, in Manhattan. I had the pleasure of being a special guest speaker on Sunday at that event, and I can tell you it's uh, those dollars are being put really to good use in remembering and recognizing our local responders. 
We have a brand new one this year that we're super excited about. It's the Rural and Indigenous Communities Grant. We're getting ready to award this one. Um, and this is really intended for rural and indigenous communities to develop or enhance a volunteer mentor or civic engagement initiative within their community. So often our dollars are getting um, allocated to organization in larger communities. And so we wanted a grant that was really specifically only for our smaller communities communities. And then we will wrap up the year in October with releasing the Martin Luther King Day of Service Grant, which is intended to fund activities and service projects honoring the legacy of Dr. King. And we're really proud of the many grant series um, that we have here. We uh, recently applied for a national award to recognize our grant making as a state commission. Um, and I'll let you know soon if we receive that. And um, this is sort of an innovative thing that other state commissions um, aren't doing across the nation. Um, we really feel like it's a way to get our smaller um, organizations connected with us. And it's a much less, uh, much less cumbersome process than our bigger grants with AmeriCorps and the Volunteer Generation Fund. So we hope that we've inspired you to learn and know more about the Volunteer Commission and that you'll want to stay connected with us. Um, our website is canserve.org, and you can find a variety of information and resources out there. We also have our newsletter tab is right um, there on the homepage. You can sign up to receive our newsletter. We are, of course, on all the social media channels, so if that's your thing, um, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram. And with that, I would love to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Dr. Dorsey. Anne? Thank you for that. You guys certainly have your hands full. I hope it's not just you over there. No, there's seven of us. Oh, great, great. Um, the uh, Civic Engagement Awards for the schools, when is that presentation? There isn't a presentation for the Civic Engagement Awards for the schools, other than I'll deliver their banners to them. Uh -huh. We don't have the event that we had at the beginning oh, it was some okay. number of years ago. Because that was fun. It was so fun. Together. Yeah. But um, so you haven't started the banner thing yet? We'll, the banners are being ordered because we just announced the winners. Oh, okay. So if we can get a list of winners yeah. when you plan to do that. I did. I brought the list of winners because I thought someone might want to know. With them. And you will get all of that information in the annual report in October. So, so none of them will be presented before October. Unlikely that that would happen just because of the time it takes to get the banners from the state printer. Okay, because I like to go to the schools when they get the yeah, banners. That's absolutely. Fine. All right, thank you. Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your presentation today. Thank you. Um, I heard, heard, you know, obviously it's federal dollars coming down, and I hear um, as, as far as like volunteer, as a, a lot of parents volunteer in the schools, or used to a lot of them, and now it's kind of like they're going through a almost like a seminar or a volunteer program, or they've got to go through some type of training. It used to be used to, you would just go up to the school and, and, and sign up and volunteer. So I just want to make sure parents are being asked first. Um, I feel like if you have a contract with the school with your child, I feel like it's a safe environment. I'm sending my kid there. I, I shouldn't have to have a background check as a parent. So I'm, I know you're talking about volunteerism. Volunteering in these schools, they have to have background checks. We want them to be safe. Safe and effective to me as a parent, another parent that I trust being in the school, me being in the school and seeing what's going on and being the eyes and ears to to go with what's going on in the schools. So I just want to make sure um, you talk about modest, modest amount of money. A volunteer is volunteer. There shouldn't be any money if it's volunteering. So it's coming from the heart. They're volunteering on their time. Some kids um, want to do an after school and make money. That's how we how businesses thrive. And we have people to, to work those jobs. So I'm wondering, are these kids that are not, you said, oh, they won't have to have an after school job. Well, we incur we would I would encourage that that they do that maybe in volunteer as well and volunteer on the weekend. I just want to encourage communities. I, I, I'm not, I'm just not a I don't know. I'm, I'm not. It's not that I'm not a fan of this. It's just that I, but the words that I'm hearing are we don't want them to have an after school job and make money. I I would encourage that over over uh, being paid a modest amount of money from federal money 
to, to, to be working? Are these kids not allowed, or, or not, um, are they not hireable? And so we're going to have them do this volunteer work and give them a modest amount of money so that they can get academic grants. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out where we're, where we're going with all this, and it's growing, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people not signing up to do, to, to do work after school, and a lot of these businesses are closing because they can't find work. Or is, is, that, is this something that's growing and that's why we're not find, finding the work from these kids after school? Yeah, so you said a lot of great things there. So I'll try and go back and address each of the comments that you made. So I do think that there um, is a variety of opinion, opinions about background checks for adults who come into the schools and so we'll leave that decision up to each individual school district to make for themselves. Um, we do promote uh, a basic level of, of background checks for our mentoring programs to ensure safety. And the volunteer programming that we're helping our schools to develop certainly will be heavily dependent on having those par parental volunteers to come into the schools. So in no way will this negate their ability to continue to do that. In fact, I think it will enhance it. We also, um, the living allowance is specifically for AmeriCorps National Service members who aren't volunteers. This is actually sort of a, a quasi work volunteer opportunity and so it's different than what we might call an employee and different than what we might call a volunteer. They're in this middle ground that's been established by the federal government. And so they set the, the, the living allowance stipend that they receive. And then the last thing that I heard you say was about um, our students with the after school jobs. I certainly didn't mean that to say that we're advocating for kids not to have after school jobs. I was just noting that this is another way for students um, to earn that living allowance while they're in the school. At Derby Public Schools, we're talking a very small number of students who are impacted in the AmeriCorps program. And so this certainly isn't something that would be widespread across the whole state. You're welcome. I just want to add that as, as a commissioner um, with the Kansas Volunteer Commission, it's been really interesting to get to know the program. And in one of my first meetings, I did ask the question, so how can my younger kids get involved? My 14-year-old can't drive yet, and so while she would love to have an after-school job, it's, it's a challenge to find something at that age. A lot of the jobs in my area are 16 plus, and being able to drive is certainly a factor. And so through the commission, she was actually a fellow commissioner directed us to a website and she was able to find something that was right down the street from our house. She now volunteers every Saturday. And while she's not getting paid, she's getting all the benefits yep. of showing up for work every week at a certain time. She works her scheduled shift. She has coworkers. So it's been a really great experience for her. And I, I thank the commission for that because we might not have connected to that otherwise. Great, thank you. Um, I also just wanted to say Huge congrats on the work that you're doing with the grants. It's always encouraging to see an organization that's able to supplement that income, um, especially with competitive grants. They're time consuming. You've got to have a grant writer. I mean, you know how much work it is. It is a huge lift to go out and apply for those grants. And so to get that extra money coming in is just fantastic. So congratulations on that work. Thank you. Any other? Jim. <clears throat> Having been here for a while and uh, been involved with the uh, Volunteer Commission. I want to uh, congratulate you and the, uh, all the folks that are making this happen because this is a real growth from 12 years ago. Yeah, 10, 12 absolutely. Years ago. Um, even from seven years ago, we've, yeah. we've really had a well, tremendous expansion. Thank you. You know, and, uh, you know, just thank you. Uh, I know a lot of board members, I will just tell you that it, it, they couldn't hear this report like this 10, 12 years ago. This is just outstanding. It's really, it, it's what the board at that time wanted to see happen. And uh, thank you for your leadership and for all the people who helped you here in the department as well as all the volunteers who have made this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all. Board members, we will take a break until 10.30.
Item number eight on today's agenda is a preview of legislative interim committees. Welcome, Craig Nineswander and Ben Proctor. Good morning, Madam Chair and board members. Thank you for the opportunity to visit with you this morning. Um, each year, in the, as a part of the legislative process, legislators have an opportunity to ask to have special committees meet during the interim in between sessions uh, so that they can spend a little more time on specific topics than they typically have time to do during the session. There is a legislative coordinating council that reviews all of those requests, and there are sometimes quite a few of them, and decides which ones would be appropriate to address that particular interim, uh, puts the committees together, and grants them a number of days to meet. And so there are a few of them that will deal with education topics this year. And we'll just give you a little idea of what those might be. Um, there's a committee that deals with mental health. Uh, we just found out there will be uh, a committee dealing with child care centers and child care homes that would like a little information uh, from our department. There is a committee specifically for education. And then uh, we have discussed before the special education task force uh, that was written into a bill last spring. So we'll update you a little bit on each of those. The mental health committee, there you see the membership. It was chaired by Senator Gossage, Vice Chair Representative Landwehr, and there you see the committee members. Um, Senator Baumgartner was not originally a part of the committee. One of the senators was not able to participate, so she sat in. Some of them were online and, and we couldn't see them, so I don't know which senator was not participating, but one of them was not participating and Senator Baumgartner was and was there live and in person. Um, they already met and on August 23rd, uh, we had a number of individuals from the agency address them. Uh, John Calvert, Angie Brungart, and Trish Backman all sat in on that committee. Uh, they had a roundtable discussion for the entire afternoon, or close to the entire afternoon, as well as that morning specific information from us about the Mental Health Intervention Team Pilot Program. And the, the focus of the committee uh, seems to be finding a way to make that program permanent in statute, rather than each year uh, through the appropriation process they fund the program and that's all you know is you've got it for one more year. Uh, it has been growing. That's the program you've asked to have $3 million added uh, in several years, including this past year, and they have done that so that we can continue to grow that. And we're up to 90 districts now uh, this year that are participating in that program. Uh, so they are looking for a way to make that a permanent uh, part of the process for public schools. And part of the issue with that is working out to me, it's an alphabet soup of different acronyms for mental health providers, since that's not really my, my area of expertise by any means. But we have community mental health centers who have always been involved in the grant program, and then federally qualified health centers and a number of others, and community mental health centers are trans, uh, transferring over to a slightly different uh, accrediting process, which will bring a whole nother set of letters into describing their name. Uh, but in any event, that's been a part of the discussion that would help make that program permanent in statute. There is another committee, the Bob Bethel Home and Community-Based Services and Can Care Oversight Committee. Uh, and, and that one meets most years as an interim. They, they are a continuous interim committee. Um, they frequently deal with mental health. It's also chaired this year by Senator Gossage, Vice Chair, Representative Landwehr, but some of the individual committee members are different, some of the same. We've been told they may discuss mental health intervention as well uh, later this interim, but at the moment, uh, we're not aware of, of that specifically. <coughs> then another committee that we just found out about, um, and, and the committee has been in place for a while, child care centers and child care homes, and you see Chair Senator Erickson, Vice Chair Representative Blue, they uh, requested just Monday, I believe, uh, if we could address them and provide information about the child and adult care food programs. And that's part of our child nutrition and wellness. Uh, so our child nutrition and wellness team doesn't just oversee 
uh, meals and food for school districts. They also receive programs for child and adult care food uh, programs. So Cheryl Johnson will address that committee on September 26th. They just wanted a general presentation about the program. Uh, what is it, who it serves, and, and uh, how participation uh, takes place in that particular program. So we'll be addressing that committee on that date. Then there was one committee assigned for education. A number of legislators requested topics specifically dealing with education, and the coordinating council put them all together into one committee and it gave them four days to meet. Those are the members of the committee that have been assigned. Representative Williams is the chair. Senator Baumgartner will be the vice chair. Uh, and they are, Senator Baumgartner, you may recall, is chair of the Senate Education Committee. Representative Williams is chair of the K-12 uh, Budget Committee in the House. And um, you will also see Representative Adam Thomas as a member of the committee, he chairs the Education Committee in the House when they meet uh, during the regular session. So topics that they requested to discuss, and there you see the dates they will meet. They have scheduled their meeting dates, October 2nd and 3rd, October 9th and 10th. Uh, we have been told by the Research Division that they are aware October 10th is a date when you will meet as a state board, so they're going to try to avoid having topics particularly involving KSDE on that date. But we have not yet seen an agenda. Uh, we're told they are getting close to having that finalized. So they will meet on those four dates. Topics they requested uh, include special education, uh, but not dealing with funding. And it was specifically stated that way, non-funding items for special education. Um, K-12 climate. So examining student and teacher expectations, outcomes, and retention, uh, we'll show you a little bit and talk to you a little bit about some of the data that they've requested for all of these topics. <laughs> and then teaching and funding of college dual and concurrent technical education courses. And part of the purpose to that, of that, if not the majority of the purpose, is working out the fact that K-12 schools sponsor career tech ed courses, vocational programs at technical colleges and community colleges sponsor career tech ed courses. Students take both concurrently um, and just making sure those two systems, KBOR and KSDE, uh, are working together in the most efficient manner and most effective manner for the students. Uh, so that will be a topic during part of that time as well. Got a question? Yes. Michelle? So Craig, just so what you say publicly, so will we have like a time and then the public about how many days do you think we'll have advance notice on that on the website to the public to show up for those meetings? Um, I can't tell you for sure the, you know, the time in advance. We were told this week that they're getting close to having the agenda f finalized, but I don't know what close means. We don't and that either. word came so from the Legislative Research much, Division. We don't know the exact times, and we don't, we, know, we don't know how much advance notice we'll get on the, on the website for that, for the public to see that so that they can show up for those. Correct. And that will, those agendas will be posted on the uh, legislative websites. There's a website specific for each committee. Um, and so if you, if you can go to that committee, you'll find the agenda. Um, it, you kind of have to know how to navigate the website to find it, though, I will say that. But they could reach out to her and find out as well. Yes. Okay. Any, any member of the committee will be able to, to tell you, obviously the chair and vice chair in particular, but any other member could fill you in if you had questions about specific topics or when should we be here to discuss or listen or what have you. So. Thank you. It has not been uncommon in the past during interim committees uh, for them to ask to hear specifically from members of the State Board of Education. We haven't seen that request yet this year, uh, but that has occurred before. And they, they typically have a specific topic they, w they would like to hear about. And, and every time I've testified before one committee, what they ask me and what they ask, what they ask me to prepare for and what they asked me when I got there were different. Um, that I'll stop there.
committee members sometimes have different thoughts than the chair might. I know that doesn't happen with, with the 10 of you, but and sometimes in the legislature, you get some questions that you weren't expecting. Uh, I, in this case, both the expectation and the questions came from the chair. Yes. I believe I was there for at least one of those occasions. Other questions or thoughts on that? Just to give you and us both a little better idea of what they may want to know about, and, and typically we are told in advance, well, we are told in advance, if they would like for anybody from our uh, agency to be there or discuss a topic, uh, we will know that, uh, but that hasn't happened yet. Uh, went the wrong way, sorry. So some information they've requested, and I need to say uh, the requests come through KLRD and they just request the information. We don't necessarily know that it's for the interim committee. It probably was. Uh, some of it may be for the upcoming uh, regular session. Um, but they asked about with all the law changes that have been put in place the last two or three years uh, from the legislature, what type of guidance do we provide school districts? So we printed off the information, copied the information that we share with school districts primarily during the budget workshops. And typically, we reprint the uh, summary of the bills that the, Kansas, that the Legislative Research Department puts together. That way, we know we're giving them the, the exact language. Um, they've asked for information on chronic absenteeism, uh, what those rates are, and high school senior attendance. Uh, special education student counts, I, I won't read the whole list to you, well I probably will actually. Uh, assessment data for students with IEPs, and one issue on data uh, we have to be careful of, we cannot give personally identifiable information uh, to anybody, legislators or otherwise. So most of that data that you see we send across as aggregate. Uh, it's not individual or even in some cases we can't give it by school district because the numbers if they disaggregate it get to be too small and become personally identifiable. Yes, in one case they, they would like to see data broken out, uh, gifted students as well as all other exceptionalities. And in many cases, we can't do that because the numbers get too small. Statewide, typically we can. Um, and uh, normally they understand that, that we are limited by numbers on some of that data. Average ACT scores by district. Uh, teacher licensure was of interest to them. Uh, what it takes to obtain a teacher license and then how many have been awarded uh, to graduates of Kansas universities. And that, that may not be worded as well as it could have been. Not to from the University of Kansas, but from universities in Kansas. And then those last three uh, have to do with a survey that they we were specifically requested to send to school districts. Uh, and Ben oversaw that process. We just got the results back. I'll let him tell you a little bit about those. Okay, thank you, Craig. Um, I'm kind of known as the survey person, so it was natural for me to, to put that together. Um, one of our staff members, Ann Yates, is just phenomenal to work with whenever we have a, a quick turnaround survey, but I wanted to, to walk through the survey items that we asked for school systems to respond to based on the legislative request. A lot of these go back to a law that was passed last year related to what was referred to as non-academic surveys, questionnaires, examinations, and we provided a lot of guidance to school districts that utilize different types of screeners and, and things like that. But just to walk through what we were asking for, and we, we got a good response rate from school districts. Um, this request was made several months ago, but we felt like to get the best response possible, we needed to at least give our administrators time to get back in the office and some of the data really gets down to the teacher level. And so there is still some survey responses. Some of them are coming in now, so we'll continue to build our report. But we did submit a report based on the response of 260 of the 286 school districts. So the items that were asked for, um, the first one, just are parents being provided specifics, the, the specific survey for their students 
every time that survey is given within that four month time frame. So that's part of the, the requirements of the law when you conduct one of those surveys that falls under the law that you have to provide that information to the parent each time you give the survey within that four month window. And we had, just to give you a report back of what we've heard from the school districts, 228 school districts said they are meeting that requirement, 23 said no. Some of the no's are because they don't do any surveying related to this as well. And just based on the construction of the survey, we, we may have to dig a little bit deeper to better understand that, uh, but that is uh, you know part of just trying to ask the right questions and get the best data back. The, the overall written consent response rate, so the affirmative written consent that's received overall as a total average across the state is about 63%. So 63% of parents are giving written consent for these varied surveys. There's a, a number of different surveys that are provided that, that fall under the requirements of that law. Another item is a copy of the test questionnaire survey provided on your website and easy to locate. 209 school districts said yes to that and 42 said no. Is the other required survey documentation easy to locate? And this would be uh, information about the publisher of these surveys. Is that posted, which is also a requirement, requirement of the law? And 211 said yes and 40 said no. And we can get this report to you so you can have this data available to you if you're interested. Another item that's not a part of that law but was uh, an informational item that was requested is related to the posting of curriculum. So is your, the curriculum that you provide to, in your school system, is that information online? Not a requirement, but 118 districts said yes, 54 said no, and 79 said they've got portions of curriculum or there's an in-progress component to the posting of curriculum on their website. One of the, the survey items that we felt like we wanted to, to make sure that uh, districts were best positioned to answer these questions and to make sure that staff, was a, they were able to respond just based on the time of year, uh, was the technology usage related to the percentage of time that students are on technology. And that's, that's a difficult survey item to construct in, in, in an effort to get the best data back. So we broke that down by grade level and asked for a response for kindergartners, first graders, all the way through 12th grade to try to, to give our best indication of, of academic time where students are using technology, uh, times when they wouldn't be engaged in academic areas during the school day, and break that down that percentage. And that'll be in the report that I share with you as far as what the results of that came back. But that was a, a little bit of a difficult one to, re, to interpret and respond to. Yes. I don't want to rabbit hole too much, but I do have a question on that. Because sure. when I looked at that data, the first thing that jumped out at me was, what is the definition of technology? Mm -hmm. And the dictionary definition of technology probably varies dramatically from what they intended when they said technology. So could you tell us briefly how you defined Technology. I think that's where we would need to better understand from the people who are asking us to conduct the survey exactly what they're wanting. We did our best just to, to define it as a, a, a student device, you know, something like that that would have a screen that would be web-based is how we interpreted that. But we'd probably have to, to maybe ask the committee exactly what they're looking for. We do anticipate the potential once the committee reviews this information, there may be some further questions that we have to dig into. So it wasn't necessarily defined for us, so we did our best to, to try to identify student devices, that type of thing, as the technology. Thank you. Um, another item that, that was asked was, uh, and this came a little bit later from the initial request, but along with student surveys that are, are conducted and given to the student to respond to, a lot of these publishers also have teacher surveys where the teacher is evaluating some of those same characteristics of the student, maybe related to behaviors or social interactions, those types of things. So the committee wanted to know how many districts require a, a teacher-conducted survey that's evaluating those types of student behaviors. And we, we found that 166 school districts re require that from their teachers and 85 said that's not required. So example would be within our, our fast bridge system where we've got academic screeners and, and 
what they call their social and emotional and behavioral screeners. There's a student component of that where students are responding to certain questions, and there's a teacher component where those same items are being responded to by the teacher on, on what they're observing in the classroom. So they wanted to know uh, the breakdown of, of how many require that and, and how many don't. A couple of additional items that are related to that, um, and these were more agency-directed questions, especially related to our contract with FastBridge that we've had for several years that uh, provides a, a discounted rate for, for schools to use these different academic and, and uh, non-academic screeners. Do we require, as a State Department, do we require school systems to use the not what they would consider the non-academic screeners, and we do not require that. That is, that is up to the school system to make that determination. They also asked about what data comes to the State Department or what data goes to any other entity, and we uh, receive academic and non-academic data we have asked, we, we don't have any purpose to receive anything that's non-academic. We do utilize the academic data from FastBridge, which would be your reading and math data to try to make connections to instructional improvements and, and comparisons with other types of academic data that we receive, but we've asked to not receive any of the other data that would be considered non-academic. So those were a lot of the questions related to the survey and just the responsibilities or guidance of the State Department. We have also uh, had some conversation with, with legislative research on the Every Child Can Read Act and what our guidance looks like around that. And uh, we've provided just information on what we've shared with school districts over the course of the past year on how they're implementing that particular law. One final uh, group, not technically a committee, a little different from the others. Special Education Task Force. This was actually written into Senate Bill 113, so it's a part of legislation um, and is uh, a requirement put into legislation by the legislators themselves and is constructed a little differently. Um, some of the members by, by the way it was written in the bill are appointed by legislators uh, you as a state board appointed one, so your chair, uh, Melanie Haas, will serve as a part of this task force. And then the last three names you see on the list were appointed by KSDE uh, and had to be specifically educators dealing in different areas of special education. Um, under the bill, the Speaker of the House appoints the representative or legislator, really, who calls the first meeting. Uh, so the speaker appointed Representative Williams to call the first meeting, but then the task force selects their chair from that point forward. Um, they have not met yet. The Legislative Coordinating Council gave them authority to meet one day during the interim session. Uh, so that, that date has not been selected or announced. The uh, legislation that was passed refers to or requires that the task force make a report annually to the legislation. So I think the vision very much was that this task force may continue to meet beyond just this interim session. This may not be a one-year issue. Uh, so that's where we stand at the moment as far as who the task force is. We have had some requests for information. And again, I don't know that there it's necessarily for the task force or if it's to be used during the uh, regular legislative session that will be starting in January. Uh, but federal funding for special education, how much does the federal government provide? We estimate that will be about $105 million this year. Uh, the federal obligation for funding, and that's going back to that issue that the federal government, when they first introduced IDEA, set as a goal to fund 40% of special education costs, they're closer to 13 or 14 percent. And then excess cost percentage by district. Um, so we provided that printout. Excess cost is by state statute to be funded at 92 percent. So 92 percent of the excess cost should be covered between 
state and federal uh, funding. Uh, it's not. We're estimated to be, uh, by 2025, close to 65%. Um, that is, in statute, calculated as a statewide number. It's not a number that applies to each individual district, interlocal, or co-op. Uh, but we have had requests from legislators. They requested it last year and are again this year. Break that out for us by district. That becomes problematic. We walked through that a little bit last spring. I'm sure it was a riveting uh, example for you to, to follow. Uh, but the issue becomes the way funding flows through districts, through interlocals, through co-ops. Uh, school districts, for instance, typically don't receive federal funds directly. The money goes to the interlocal or the co-op instead. Interlocals don't have uh, expenditures for regular education students. The school district does. Well, both of those pieces of information are a part of the formula to determine excess cost. So as an individual entity, either a district or an interlocal, if you don't have one or the other, it really skews your percentages. So those numbers look strange when you see them. Uh, as a statewide formula, it, it gives you a picture as an individual district, interlocal or co-op, not necessarily so. Uh, but in any event, that was requested. Um, and as I said, we don't know when they will meet uh, or if that information was for that committee or for later in the regular session. Jim Porter. We have made requests for the last several years to uh, to get to 92%. That has basically been ignored uh, by the legislature. And, and so I assume that this committee was put together to address that issue. And in my prejudice view, uh, change the 92%. Uh, we need some stability in special education funding. What is the possibility that this meeting will not even be called? Um, I guess and I don't expect you to be Solomon, <laughs> you know. that. In, in response, I would say you can hear any rumor you want right now. One of the rumors is the, this committee will not meet prior to the session. They will and in that case, there will be no definitive uh, recommendations to the legislature from that committee about how to address special education funding and will continue to be in limbo, but the 92% the, the will still be part of statute and something that we should aspire toward. That is correct. Thank you. Commissioner. By the data that's already been requested from the department, um, oftentimes you will see reports and it will say source KSDE. This will be one of those. But as Craig said, to use that excess cost percentage by district and then to say, well, look at Eureka or look at Santa Fe Trail will not tell you anything uh, related to how that, that formula works. It's a it's a misuse of the data related to how the formula was developed on a statewide basis. I just need to say that again. Craig has done his best to explain how excess cost is determined statewide. And he's explained to you that if your district runs it interlocal or a co-op, it skews then that number when you look at it individually. I just say that because at some point, someone's gonna say to you, well, look at the excess cost. The next district gets this, the next district gets that, and we have to balance it. That is a misuse of that data related to how the school funding formula works. And, and so I, I don't know what that, that information is going to show them other than that, Craig. That, that's basically it. And you will hear legislators talk about exactly what Randy said. Well, this district's getting 117% of excess costs. So that's not right. They're getting too much. They, I have not, I shouldn't say they don't say. I have not heard many point out that, oh yeah, we've got a district over here getting 61%, but we hear about the ones that, again, the numbers being skewed make it look like they get 117%. You will not find a district that is transferring less from their general fund and LOB into special education than they receive in state aid. They all have to transfer more money than what they receive from the state. 
Craig, can you give an example of a district that's at 117 or thereabouts percent? And, uh, and what the math on that looks like, right? If you could itemize it sure. out, you've got to have certain. So um, start with the beginning. A district, for instance, and uh, happened to have one of these superintendents in the office asking about it. So on our list, side by side, uh, just the way the numbers fell, we had Olathe and we had Fort Scott. Both run their own special education. They don't belong to an interlocal or co-op. Olathe is, if you run the formula through just on them, is at 61%. Fort Scott's the 117%. And so the question naturally is, well, why? Um, part of it, a large part of it, has to do with the way the, the excess cost formula is calculated. You take into account the money that's spent on general education for special education students. So if you spend money on um, band, on math, but that student doesn't have an IEP in math, that's just their general education expenditures, that's factored in to the excess costs. Now there's a, a whole other argument on why that's really kind of strange because that money's not spent out of the special ed fund. It's spent out of general fund, but yet we're going to subtract it from the special ed money. That's the way the statute was written. Well, when you do that and you compare Fort Scott's demographics with Olathe's, I don't remember the percentages now, but Fort Scott's a lot higher in at-risk funding than Olathe is. They have more kids on free meals. That means they're receiving more money for general education expenditures. They're spending more on general education expenditures per student than Olathe is. So when you subtract that out of their special ed expenditures, Fort Scott doesn't have much left to be excess cost. Olathe has quite a bit left. And as a result, the state aid that Olathe gets only covers about this much. Fort Scott's only got this much in excess cost because we took out all the general fund money, even though it wasn't spent for special ed. And they're covered up 117%. So again, it's a, a conflict within the formula when you try to apply it to an individual district. Statewide, those things kind of balance out and you get a, a truer picture of what's really happening. Thank you. And that, there are other reasons for those differences, but that's just one example. And, and in essence, in defense of everyone trying to understand special ed funding, a lot of people spend a lot of effort trying to understand base state aid funding and the weightings because it can be complicated. And you, the more time you spend understanding that, the less time you'll understand special ed funding because it's totally different. And so I think people come at it and they're trying to use that lens to, to, to look at, and that I think is what complicates the understanding of, of special ed funding. And, and just to elaborate on that a little bit, in the regular education formula, everything's based on how many students you have. What's, what's the, you get a base amount per student, how many students do you have on free meals, how many are in career tech ed, how, everything's about how many students are involved in a particular program. Special education is not funded based on the number of students. It's funded based on your transportation costs, on what it costs to provide services for the student, and how many teachers and paras are you paying. So that, the number of teachers and paras plays a big role too in that difference between 117% and 61% and how much you have to pay those teachers and paras. I, I just could go on about this and you say, well, what's the difference? Well, a learning disabled child may be being served predominantly in the classroom with, with some support services. A severely autistic kid may have a full-time teacher, full-time para, may, you know, may, may be self-contained. And so there's everything in between. And that, that's why you don't know that. And you, know, you don't even know that by year. So services can, can range wildly. And then the cost of those services can range wildly. Craig would be happy to sit down with people and explain this in detail, uh, but it, it, is, it is much different than when you're trying to study base state aid and, and weightings. We've had a lot of practice explaining it the, over the last year. I'm not <laughs> sure we've gotten any better at it, but we're, we're trying. Craig, I have another question. If there was a bullet here at the end and they were asking for percentage of IEPs by district, uh -huh. does that help with understanding of the equation? 
Uh, yes and no, uh, because there is a variation across the state. It's not a huge variation. Some have a higher percentage of students on an IEP, uh, some don't. But then within that number, you have to consider what Dr. Watson just said. Some, not all IEPs are created equal in terms of cost. Some require a large number of personnel to provide for that particular need and therefore more money, and some don't. Are you including gifted in that formula? Yes. In, in Kansas, just so maybe to clarify why Jim keeps asking about that, in Kansas, gifted is an IEP for special education. That's not true in all states. Sorry, I didn't see the two more questions. Dennis. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you explain to us why some districts are, I, I think I understand in the smaller districts, they're interlocal because the geographics and whatever Correct. in the small numbers. Why is it, is that just across the state uh, prevalent that some districts decide to do their own thing or can you yes, help me understand that? That's a choice made by a local board uh, about how they can best serve their students. And in some cases, it's by providing our own services, uh, either because we're large enough or we have the staff, we believe we have the staff that can do that. Or as you said, sometimes it's geographically. Um, we're not real large, but we're so far from anybody else. We'll try it on our own. Uh, typically, if you're a small district, uh, it's much more efficient if you can work with another district because you don't need a full-time uh, occupational health therapist, but if you could share that service, then then they're better served. But that's a local board decision how they choose to provide special education services. Well, do, does the local board then um, come to you and, and ask if it's uh, financially more efficient that way? I mean, do you get those requests to be um, in on the conversation? We have the request frequently. We don't uh, very often run through the numbers with them because they know the details better than we do. I, I shouldn't say it that way. We do review the numbers with them. But as far as making a comparison about, well, could we provide the services on our own? We're not familiar enough with their students and all their specific services. Um, typically, we get the question from districts that are a part of an interlocal or part of a co-op and Nobody's ever happy with what it costs to provide special education, particularly when you're not being funded at 92%. So districts will frequently look at, well, what if we did it this way, or what if we broke up? And if a co-op or interlocal breaks up, there's a very specific process they have to go through to do that, which includes coming to you as the final step before they have authority to actually change that. And part of what you look at is are they going to be able to provide the same or better service for those students at no additional cost to the state? Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Ann. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm happy or sad the special ed committee might not be meeting. I mean, we all understand the politics of why Representative Williams wouldn't call it, but I know there was some discussion um, when we were there last session about couldn't we just make this a lot simpler? Like if you've got an IEP, you get X thousand per kid like we do base state aid. And I know you guys tried to explain that no, you know, you have a kid with an IEP who may have one service, but another one may have six services, you know. And so it makes a lot more sense to fund per service that you have to provide because you don't know what it's going to look like. So. I don't know, I guess we'll see, but I'm really scared for special ed funding altogether that they won't try to really understand the services that have to be provided, but we'll see. No more questions. Oh, Jim. <clears throat> Just to add to that, um, the services, regardless of the cost, are paid for by the district. Yes. And the bulk of the money is really coming from general fund money. Yes. That, that's, that's the issue. You know, you have a student, and, and I've had a student that was costing us almost $2,000 a day. Sure, that's true. Um, oh, multiple handicapped, you know, but, but a great kid, you know, and, and needed the services. But that service was being paid for by general fund money. Special ed money did not cover virtually none of it. Not virtually, but 
did not cover what it was supposed to cover. You know, yeah. Two powers, special nurse, you know, wheelchairs. Yeah, I'm just, but most kids aren't like that. But the reality is, is that um, the state is, is not funding special education at the rate it should, should not funding regular education, but the regular education dollars are picking up a large portion of the special ed uh, re re cost, different than funding. And, and I probably ought to back up with when I said yes on the bulk of the funding. 65% of excess cost, our estimate, is going to be covered by state and federal aid. So somebody's going to quibble with me with the bulk of cost, but a large portion, as you said, but it's is not definitely the 90%. general fund and LOB. It's not 92 percent. 92 percent. Excuse me. And when you don't, and the thing I want to press here is that the money that that makes the difference between uh, what's what is funded and what should be funded, that gap is being paid for by the money that the school district gets just for education. Yeah. And that's, I, I maybe belabor this point sometimes, but I haven't mentioned it today, so I'll say it. Uh, the issue with special education funding is services are required by both state and federal law. So when the funding comes up short, you don't get to decide, well, we'll hire fewer special ed teachers. As Jim said, you take the money from another program and pay for special education. Confirming. That's the end. You guys are done? All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next up, item number nine is action on the contract with KELI commissioner. We call that Kelly, and Shane's going to do a good job. This was, this is typically every year in consent, but I thought you're not going to know about this and the long history of it. So I asked Shane just to kind of go over that with me. Welcome, Shane Carter. Well, Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, please bear with me just a moment. I need to figure out what's going on with the presentation. There we go, so we have it. So you know, originally, uh, this was gonna be part of our consent agenda, but we thought we would take the opportunity to give you that background as the commissioner mentioned. So uh, the, the Kelly, Kansas Educational Leadership Institute, it's been around since 2011. And what's important is it's kind of an extension of the, the agency, the work that they do. Uh, it's, it's based in K -State, at K-State in Manhattan. Uh, you may be familiar with the executive director, one of my favorite people that I've had the pleasure to work with, but uh, Dr. Michelle Miller is the uh, executive director. Uh, many of you know that she held a, a position of director of teacher licensure and accreditation uh, before she moved into that position. So she's currently leading that, but uh, prior to her um, assuming the control of, uh, of Kelly, uh, it has existed for many years. And that institute is a point of collaboration between uh, the agency and many of our other professional organizations all geared towards making sure that we're supporting and training our uh, next um, administrators in Kansas. So a lot of their work deals with uh, district administrators, uh, which I mentioned in here, but they also work with principals as well. Uh, as we boil it down, um, you know, in 2011, the need for mentorship uh, and, and the importance of mentorship for individuals that are moving into those new leadership positions uh, was identified, and that's you know one of the, the main basis why this organization was set up. And as far as the services that they provide uh, for KSDE are centered on uh, either uh, providing those mentors, one-on-one -on -one mentors to new superintendents, or providing professional learning opportunities for them as well. So over the years, we have had an, a contract established with them. What we've required uh, them to do for us has kind of differed uh, as we transition through KESA at one, part, uh, at one point. Uh, they provided some additional assistance in, in, in that arena for us. But you know, as I stated, that leadership uh, mentoring is the, is the constant. And as far as our contract that we're looking to renew, uh, that would be the main uh, premise of why 
uh, we're seeking uh, this additional funds to help assist with uh, mentor stipends and travel costs for uh, providing those services on behalf of the agency. And as far as the contract, we're currently in the last year. Uh, the previous contract was for five years. Uh, it's set to terminate on June 30th of 2024. So we're looking to, uh, this is kind of the first step to get the, the contract established and then submitted for final approval. So um, uh, as I stated, Kelly will continue to provide those services and they're also gonna do some work uh, for us as far as uh, uh, the Kansas leadership standards that we have. So pending your questions, this would be the recommended motion. Kathy? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what do you see as the outcome side of what do you, what's your, I mean, how do you, how are you measuring or what are you, what feedback are you getting from those who are receiving those services? Yeah, so um, right now, as far as you, the mentorship piece, there, the, the feedback and the effectiveness, we do need to put some tighter controls on that as far as what we receive at the state. Uh, what we do is kind of look at some of the numbers of, of the mentors that they serve and uh, as we review their mentoring plans that are submitted to us for approval. But uh, with work through the PSB, we are digging into this. So right now, that there is a gap that we do need to work on and collect more uh, information. So one of the things we're looking to establish is um, surveys with both um, the individuals that are going through the program and um, you know with those districts that they're working in as well. Shane, does this have any tie-in with last month we heard about, just a little bit, about the building leadership assessments? Can you help us connect the dots on what leadership means in this context? Yeah, so from my perspective, you know, for this, this training, what this provides is one, it, uh, we require for license upgrade individuals to complete mentoring programs to be able to qualify for that professional license. Now, when they're actually in the field and they're working and um, you know, going through their KISA accreditation, this type of program would be there to support them as they're looking at and evaluating uh, the data sources for that building assessment. So that's kind of functionally assisting them do their job, if you will. So kind of serving that link to assist them with those skills. Thank you. Anne. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just gonna say anecdotally, um, you know, no matter what the you know, the data looks like. I hear from a lot of, you know, we have a lot of turnover in superintendents, and it's it's a huge, huge job. So uh, I've heard from several, you know, new superintendents that, you know, my mentor is this person, and it was really valuable for me to have that person, you know, to turn to and, you know, help me walk through all the things we have. I see Jim's up, but I'm ready to make a motion unless that's what you were going to do. I was just going to say that in the past, most people that went into administration had had numerous years of experience uh, before they moved into that area. Now that's becoming lesser and lesser and lesser because of the shortage of administrators. So a principal may become a principal after two years experience. We have superintendents that maybe only had four or five years of experience before they reached that role. Mentoring is much, is a critical element, but I'll uh, refer back to Ann to make the motion. Are we ready? Thank you. I move that the Kansas State Board of Education authorize the Commissioner of Education to enter into a contract with the Kelly Organization to continue to provide mentor services to district administrators for the period of July 1, 2024 through June 30th, 2029 in an amount not to exceed 60000 annually. Second from Betty. Any further discussion or questions? Jim. <coughs> When I became an administrator in the state of Kansas in 1980, there was no mentorship, there was no support systems. You know, you just kind of did it, you know. And uh, I was fortunate enough at that time at the first league meeting to have a uh, principal from another one of our districts uh, that was in the league ask me if I had any questions. You know, I said, a lot of them, <laughs> and uh, he helped me a lot. He wasn't, you know, overbearing. He wasn't. He was just there. I had a couple of special ed qu questions, particularly, that he was able to help me with, as I recall right now. But uh, just having that person to talk to and call up was very important, you know. And I'm glad to see that this has emerged over time, to where today, like 35, 40 years later, um, we're making sure that. Uh, 
administrators, whether they want to or not, are going to have some support, new administrators, as they move into jobs. And with as many new administrators as we have, it is very important for our state to have that support system available for those that are entering the profession and for, or at the level, the new level they're approaching, they're entering, excuse me. So I'm, I, this is a great program. This is and, and very much needed. Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a real quick question. So as, so as far as all the turnover that Ann was talking about, as far as superintendents, um, is, is how did they come up with the 60,000? I mean, how do we come up with that as far as like, if they're, if you have all these, all this turnover, so who's, do they just always have somebody on ready to go to be mentor to, for a mentorship, or how many are we? How many superintendents are we talking about in that mentorship? Yeah. yeah. So you know, as far as you know, mentoring, you know, from the license perspective, we'll have uh, new administrators that are moving that position. You know, anywhere from, uh, you know, possibly thirty to forty superintendents. Uh, it's not only for superintendents, the superintendents, also for assistant superintendents as well, if they fill those roles. So we're probably talking somewhere around, uh, you know, probably 100, 150 to 200, probably 150 to 200 at, at any given year of people moving in and qualifying for those licenses at any given time. And then once they qualify for the license, they have to move into a position that requires it in order to, to complete this mentoring. So so some people may have qualified for that license and you know they're backdated a couple years and then finally move into a position and then they'll start their mentoring with Kelly to. Is this, is this similar to like the teacher mentorship thing that we did that we, you know they get a little stipend as far as like for helping if they're you know third year or what you know is that kind of what the, is that yes compensation it's a, it, it's for a, these? A, yes that and travel to uh, provide uh, that one-on-one -on -one, um, mentorship to that individual and doing side visits. So it helps with, it's a very small stipend and then also pays for some travel for that. So that's a, it's a small drop in the bucket of what it actually costs to make this program successful. So let me just kind of expand that. So it's also special ed directors that are new and they can also be mentored in a second year. <coughs> Shane said there's a stipend and then a travel if, if they travel. Kansas State University provides the main bulk of the money for this. The other organizations kind of cooperatively also uh, help offset some of the cost. I want to chime in here too because when I look at that number, I think that is just a fraction of what some superintendents make. And if you save one superintendent, if you keep one person in a position for an extra year, I mean, you start making that money back very, very quickly. Okay. Any additional comments, questions? We have a motion and a second. Are we ready to vote? All in favor, raise your hand. That is a 10 0 vote. Okay, thank you, Madam thank Chair. You. All right. Item 10 Act to approve AP seminar. Commissioner Walker. And Joanne McCrell is making her way up to the podium. So, uh, this is, we're going to be talking about the use of some ESSER funding at the state level and that concept of rigor and, uh, and trying to help school districts provide a more rigorous uh, education and kick off a, a new uh, course for English and I'll let Joanne take it from there. I think around October, um, I was approached by the college board and they have a new class called AP Seminar English 10. And the data on this course looks amazing. Um, what it does is it starts to become a feeder for all kids. I, I want to stress that for all kids. Um, and taking in the diversity of those kids, 88% um, of them pass the um, assessment at the end of the year with a three or four, which means that they get my old term was we get clepped out, right? Um, but basically what that means is that the um, kids get college credit. And um, the college board has been making the rounds as far as college credit is concerned to start to see um, the post-secondary institutions that would take this as um, a comp class or an elective of that sort, and um, we have a number already, all of our D2 schools, I think, and then our D1 um, do provide um, credit for this, and we're trying to get it pushed a little bit further as far as that, that um, 
English comp credit of your writing. Um, so that being said, um, we started to uh, reach out to districts in order to get them aware of this new course code that we added to our catalog last year around this time. Um, and provided webinars, did experiences for them. Um, we have right now um, 33 schools that are participating in AP um, seminar English 10. Um, we have 82 teachers trained across the state. Um, this summer, they went to the APSI training, which is a summer institute for AP training. Um, and we are getting excellent feedback. We um, have schools that have never had AP in their class at all. We have schools that have already contacted us about, hey, this is great, I walked in, um, what I saw was just amazing. I can't believe our kids are already doing this. We're, we're talking three weeks of school, right? They're able to read complex text, they're attacking the text, they're coming up with a claim, they have evidence, um, and they're working together as far as the collaborative skills, the soft skills that we're talking about, um, they are getting those. And one of the things that I wanna stress is the, the Western, uh, Western Kansas was um, kind of like, well, you know, we're a farming community. Our, our kids are gonna farm. Like, they're not gonna go away, they're not gonna go do college. And we're like, yeah, but think about that for a second. When you need to go in for a bank loan, right, in order to um, uh, grow your ranching operation, you have to have that argument. You have to have data that proves that you're going to do this. So we're talking about all kids. We're not just talking about our um, 4.0 uh, kiddos who uh, have taken coursework. The other thing about this class is it's an entry class. So kids start to recognize that they can and they're finding out that um, that leads them to start to implement further other AP courses in order for their kids to become um, that much further ahead as far as rigor, okay? So it's not just our, our schools that are getting AP because they are upper SES, upper and middle class kiddos who have the backgrounds and means necessary and someone to guide them through the college experience. But now we're looking at those kids that have, haven't had that opportunity and they're doing it at 88%. So anyways, that's the reason why I, I pushed for this. Um, the College Board has been wonderful. They've, uh, they've uh, trained our teachers for free. Um, they have been, uh, very helpful in the direction that I wanted to take this and have been truly collaborative and a partner. Um, one of the things that we found, however, is that our schools with the low SES, uh, $140 for an assessment, they didn't think that there, there's other places that that money needs to go right now. And so we looked at the opportunity of then for this first year, of providing that expense to be reimbursed um, from the $100,000 that we're proposing to cover all AP Seminar English 10 assessments. Um, and so then we can figure out the financial pieces of how to um, local schools and agencies and, and possibly um, the legislature of, of helping us fund this further. Um, a, a question that was asked is, you know, why, why are you going to do with this information? One of the things that I told um, Dr. Watson was that I really wanted this first year of assessment um, to watch the growth and see the correlation with our new assessment coming out in 2025. Um, we do not have an assessment that is going to be bridged this year to next year. Um, and so having our kiddos take that assessment, this pilot, well, not pilot year, but this implementation year is, is very important for me to get data 
to see if the rigor is transferring over to our English 10 um, CAP assessment for ELA. Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just, just to make, you know, make a public statement that AP is national, <laughs> AP is national. Um, so I had, a, I had a constituent ask um, for parents that opt their children out of the state assessments. If there, if does this class, da, this classroom or data assessment, would this replace that assessment that, that they're not taking at the state level? No, we're not looking at that. Okay, no. um, so so that was what that was one of my questions. And as far as like um, AP and honors, there's a there's a difference between honors, obviously, and a lot of people lean towards that because it's more Kansas driven, more state, more local than what AP is. AP mm -hmm. is is definitely more national. Just so you, I think everybody knows that. If not, they need to they need to know that. So um, I, I just wanted to make that that statement public. One of the things that I'll I'll hit on though that even though it is a national program, there's a lot of student voice and choice um, within the projects that they choose to research in this class and also the teams that they build. Now a teacher can um, build those teams um, and sometimes kids will select their teams so that, that depends upon the teacher. But when we start to look at a Kansas honor program versus um, an AP seminar, uh, the rigor is very different. It's very different and uh, some of our larger districts couldn't onboard this year because their course catalogs had already been set. And they, uh, so they're taking a, a, a soft open or a pilot year, they're calling it, so that they can get it in. And yes, it will affect, but they're, they're looking at it as, you know, okay, so what do we do with our honors course? Do we replace it with this? Or do we look at this as a higher, level honors course. So there is a lot of discussion going on amongst the um, districts about how that plays within their local control. Ken. Do you want to follow up? Sure. Um, so, so as far as like AP, a lot of those, a lot of those um, cl classes are, uh, the assessments are adaptive. Would you say, would you agree with that? As far as the assessments go, because you're, you're saying I'm not really looking at that data. What what data? And you're talking about rigor. Are what are what are you trying to glean from that from that data? I guess is what I'm trying to say. Because a lot of those tests are uh, or assignments and everything are adaptive. They're done on computers and they're done collaboration with other children. But there are students there. But they're adaptive. They're the the questions are adaptive. No, um, what, what they would be given in AP Seminar English 10 is they would be given a stock set of documents and it comes from um, different areas. So you would have one in fine arts, you might have um, pictures or graphs, you may have uh, an opinion article, you may have uh, just information article, um, but it comes from all these different backgrounds, just not ELA. And so then what the kids have to do for their assessment, um, it's twofold. Um, one of the things that they have to do is they have to um, get into a team collaboration and each one of them take one of those lenses. So I might take, since I'm the ELA queen, right? I, I would take the, the literary view and I would, I would do that for our team. And another kiddo might have the science background and he would take that lens. And so they're given a, um, a set, basically a text set, in order to come up with their ideas. However, they can take that wherever they want to go for the individual portion of that grade. So if I wanted to, okay, yeah, I'm an ELA person, but after listening to my science guy, I could see that I could take this idea and apply um, my own personal opinion and research that. So there's kiddos that have um, done all kinds of things as far as um, relating back to their community and community improvement. Um, their interest as far as gaming and how, how uh, looking at motivation and how motivation um, within gaming is sustainable for kids and the reasons why. Um, so it becomes very individualized. 
And, and then there's the individual portion where I think you're talking more of is here's, here's the information. You have to use two um, pieces of information from this different tech set now that we haven't worked together as a team. And now let's see how you do as far as claim and supporting evidence and your individual presentation. So um, I, don't, I don't know if that helps the rest of you as far as what the assessments look like, but. Anne. Joy, I really wanna thank you for bringing this to us. I mean, if we can use this really small amount of money to help kids who otherwise wouldn't have had this opportunity, Oh my gosh, and you know, as much as we've talked about how we have to improve rigor, um, I mean, we just don't have the kind of rigor across the state that we need to, and if this can carry over into improved assessment, state assessment scores, I mean, having a national test to me is a benefit, not a detractor, so thank you for bringing this to us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I echo Ann's sentiments, and Secretary, Secretary Cardona was just here a week ago talking about raising the bar, and when I think about rigor, I think about AP. Noor Heathery stood here yesterday and said she was taking five AP classes, mm -hmm. and that was, I choked up. I mean, I can't imagine um, what that workload must look like for her, and yet she's seeking that rigor, and the feeling that a student has when they get that test score and realize that they've gotten a three or better there is no better, um, you know, validation for them and for the students that you're talking about for whom the price of the test is a hurdle. They worry about their performance. They worry about whether, you know, whether that money does need to go somewhere else. So if we can remove that hurdle for those students, I think that that's huge. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I want to just refresh your memory on what you're voting on. So um, this is a voluntary program meaning schools say, yes, I want to do it, or no, I don't. Students voluntarily decide whether they're going to take the class or not. This money, which would be a little bit part of our ESSER set aside, would go for the first year to pay for that student that, that wants to take the class to take the assessment, which costs $140. That, that, that's what you're voting on. Any additional questions? Dennis. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do you have any idea what how this would grow and, and how it would be funded in the future? Um, honestly, uh, we're looking at adding 100 schools. That's our, that's a very, <laughs> it's a very tall order. Um, but we already have uh, four to five that say, hey, we didn't know about this. Like we would, we want to do, we, we want more information. So we're starting that webinar series again. So we are looking at growth. Um, again, I, I want that correlation in data. I want that correlation that says that, right? Um, but I can't, I can't say that we will get that. Um, but uh, the College Board has um, come in and discussed as far as legislatures and um, talking to the legislature about funding for our kids. Yeah, yeah that's what I was wondering whether it would come around again mm -hmm. for us to look at. Mm -hmm. So it, it you know, this, this, this will be a one-time mm -hmm to get this off with the federal COVID, we won't be able to put any more money mm -hmm. into this. It would have to be either local or legislatively funded. Yeah, we'll find, we'll find a way, grants, something. If it's, if it's correlating, I'm, I'm, I'll find a way. Just to refresh my memory, what, uh, what was the initial pilot program in numbers? As, as far as districts are Oh, we have 33 schools right now. We okay. have an additional five that are doing a, a soft open or pilot um, because it's not in their course catalog. And then we had four or five drop because of teacher um, retention issues. Okay. So um, I'm sure that they'll be back on once they have a teacher that would be able to provide the instruction that they feel confident in because they were very... Um, interested uh, in that. We have 82 teachers trained across the state. So those that are doing the soft open already have uh, training. Okay. Any further questions, discussion? Anyone like to make a motion? I will. Thank you, Bobby. I move that the Kansas State Board of Education approve this action item to reimburse students who are taking the assessment aligned with the AP seminar, English 10 coursework. Is there a second? Jim McNeese. 
All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? That's 9-1. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to our consent agenda. We approved the consent agenda as amended yesterday, so we don't have to vote on that today. We have four items today that we'll vote on. We'll vote on consent as amended. Jim's making a face. Do you have a question? Okay. We'll vote on consent as amended, and then we'll go through items D, E, and P individually. So may I have a motion? That's interesting. We had the motion to approve it as amended. Um, so I need a motion to vote on. To, without these. So I need another motion to vote on consent. Anne. Well, I mean, we've already voted on the agenda. Can I move that we approve everything except D, E, and P? You may do that. Yes. And a second from Jim Porter. Any additional discussion on consent agenda as amended? All in favor, raise your hand. That is 10-0, motion passes. So the first item that was pulled is item D. Oops. Act to approve recommendations for licensure waivers. Welcome yes. back, Shane Carter. He is here to answer any questions. Do you wanna pr provide us just a brief overview what exactly is in item D? Yeah, so um, every month, once a month, on the 15th of the month, we pull waivers from school districts. So a couple of different reasons why you would receive waivers are one, if an individual is enrolled in, let's say, a special education pro program but have not yet qualified for a provisional license, a district would submit a waiver for that uh, occurrence. And um, basically how um, our licensing process for the special education endorsement, an individual could be on a waiver for you know, approximately three years uh, before they would need to transition to that provisional license in that special education category. Uh, the other reason, and the majority of the um, waivers that you will review today are based on extensions to the number of days an individual with a substitute license can stay in a position. Uh, as per our accreditation regs, 91-31-34, uh, I think, is the, uh, or 91-31-34 governing body requirements. Uh, it establishes the limitations to number of days that an individuals with specific types of substitute licenses can serve in a position. Uh, the, the, that uh, reg also allows them to submit a waiver if the district is in a situation that requires that person to serve an extended amount of days beyond that limitation. Uh, and this is, you know, this has been part of the accreditation reg for many years. Um, during uh, COVID and a couple years uh, after, you know, COVID, uh, the state board had uh, implemented an emergency declaration that kind of allowed districts to receive that extension without submitting the waivers, but this year we're moving back in, uh, to having districts submit waivers for extension to number of days. So you will see a lot of those um, throughout the year. A couple of questions, Jim Porter. This is, it deals with the emergency. Uh, you know, as you indicated in the past, we have extended our, that, and I've had several uh, correspondence from special, especially special ed directors asking us to reconsider that, and I'd like to at least address that at some point in the future. Sure. Okay. Kathy. I guess I thought we did address that. Um, so the emergency sub, mm -hmm. which is 93 of these 124 24. waivers, extending the number of days under their license. So the emergency sub, just to make sure I'm tracking, high school diploma, 18 years of age, take some, no? no? So I'll go ahead and break that down. So there's three tiers to the emergency substitute okay, license. Thank you. So um, one way that an individual qualifies if they have a bachelor's degree from an accredited university that we recognize, they'll qualify for an ESUB. That's the highest level of emergency substitute license we offer and it has a limitation of 45 days in the classroom with that particular license. There's a second tier, which is the uh, individual that has at least 60 college credit hours from originally accredited college or university, but doesn't have that full bachelor's degree. And uh, their limitations are 25 days in the class in, a, uh, in the same position and limited to no more than 75 days mm -hmm. uh, during a semester in a particular school district. And then we have the 
third tier, which was formerly known as the TEAL license, the emergency modified substitute license, uh, in which an individual completes the, they have a high school diploma, completes the um, Greenbush training modules, and has an offer for hire from the school district. Uh, they apply for that license. Right now, the limitations for that license are consistent with an individual that has 60 college credit hours. So they're limited to 25 days in the same assignment and no more than 75 days in the, in the district. They are not eligible for waivers. Okay. So our office goes through whenever waivers are submitted, we do checks to make sure that individuals are qualified for these waivers. So there were some districts that tried to or erroneously submitted those individuals for waivers and we removed them from this list and contacted the district to advise okay, them of so that. So none of these on here is that actual license? That is correct. So they're able to carry this license while they're doing the transition to teach? They already yeah, have in, in some cases, So that yes. wouldn't be a, I guess I thought that was just a straight substitute license. So is that? Okay, so that's another tier of license. Okay. So if an individual has completed a teacher preparation program, the individual can qualify for a standard substitute license. That's okay. a five-year license, and that individual is limited no, to no more than 90 days in the, in the same assignment. So Okay. But on these, my understanding was still that they were not expected to be a classroom teacher, like of record. Is that... Well, if, if, if the district is submitting a waiver, they're saying that this person's going to be in there for an extended amount of time. So yes, they would be in they essence serving as that teacher of record. Okay. Thank you for now, clarifying. For now, me. there is one, one instance where I need to clarify. So if an individual is on like extended leave, let's say um, maternity leave or something like that, you actually have a higher teacher that's filling that vacancy. This person's coming in uh, for a short amount of time, but that short amount of time may exceed that 25, 45 days that are on their license. So technically... They're not the teacher of record. It's that contracted teacher that's on maternity leave. Right, right. Confusing, I know. Mm -hmm. now, now, Kathy, what just, you Just heard, when I thought I had it down. <laughs> what you heard is Jim saying, but I'm hearing from people we want to open that. So I, I just want you to put the two together, what? which you can't do right now. But he's saying that we should. maybe we want to revisit that. Mm. Shane, I think you just answered it, but I'm going to reiterate sure. it for the record. Um, there is a set of criteria for waivers. Mm -hmm. You went through the criteria, already weeded out some, and said these don't qualify. Correct. And so there's a system in place. There's a checklist in place. Um, I had a question about number of days. I think that was all answered. So, okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions on this topic? Perfect. You're welcome. Ready to vote on approval for item D. I need a motion. I move that we approve item D of the consent agenda. Thank you. Second from Betty. All in favor, raise your hand. This is a 10 0 vote, passes. Thank you. Item E, act to approve amending, and thank you, Shane. Act to approve amending the state assessment contract with the Achievement and Assessment Institute. I'll take that one. You don't see anyone running to the podium. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will say that uh, Beth Foltz normally would be here, but she's having uh, um, some family issues, so she's not able to attend today. So as you will remember in the last legislative session, the legislatures voted that anyone who is remote or in a virtual environment can now take the state assessment at home. Okay. They said do that. The problem is, as we've t told you, if any of those students would happen to post on social media, uh, an eighth grader as an example, oh, look at this, I just did these questions, um, it invalidates the test. So we have to have some test security that that student isn't cheating, if you would, or using resources they shouldn't. But this contract says it's no additional money. So we're going to take the exist, existing money that we allocate to the um, Achievement and Assessment Institute at KU and move that money so they can create some test security protocols that we can test those virtual students with some sense of security. That's what this is. Because we have to meet the, the, the needs of the law and we're trying to minimize the opportunities that the whole test becomes invalidated and they're going to have to help us with that. So. No additional, it's a reorganization of the contract. Ann. 
And we tried and tried and tried and to get legislators to understand the pickle they were putting us in. They did not want to get it. They, for whatever reason, so I think if we can do this without any additional funds, we really need to protect the system and, and just not let it go down in flames because we don't like what they did. We have to protect the system. I just want you to know, and Craig told you this, this when we went through, so if someone does violate um, the protocol and that exam at any level, fourth grade, is exposed, that ex entire exam becomes invalid. And since we go so cheaply on this contract with state assessment, we don't have alternate forms of the assessment. If that occurs, we will have to ask the legislature for more money to rebuild an entire state assessment for that grade level for the next year. So that's what we're hoping doesn't happen, but I just wanted you to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Michelle, and then Thank Dennis. you, Madam Chair. So it's interesting, on in the federal level, any national assessment, it's up to a $250,000 fine and up to five years imprisonment if you, if you um, uh, share or uh, express any any of these examinations. It's 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 out there online. You can read it. So uh, so there. So if we're not going to put any accountability in place for people that are uh, taking these assessments and sharing that, and then we have to the test is invalidated. And all those people that took the time out of their day to take the test, which would, which would be like an assessment on. Uh, we wouldn't do that for ACT. We wouldn't do that for SAT, SATs. Uh, any national any other national assessments. So I'm not sure why we're not putting something in place that says, Kansas, if you share that information, because it it's going to keep happening, it's going to be very expensive. So, I mean, it, it, like I said, it's $250,000 fine to imprisonment if you share a national assessment <laughs> with somebody else or, or publicly or share it or uh, plagiarize it or whatever. So um, what are we putting in place that this could just cost us an enormous amount? So what are we putting in place? You're correct. There was no money allocated to us despite asked to try to mitigate this. So, so, so we, our proposal was keep doing what they're doing, which is virtual students have to come to a brick and mortar and actually right. do it. That was denied by the legislature. So we're kind of stuck, Michelle, in that the law was passed and now we're trying to mitigate the opportunity, or the, not the opportunity, but the possibility that there may be a violation of that in the best way that we can without any additional funds. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I just, I, I, I mean, obviously, I'm not for that, the bill that they passed. And, and I just feel like, I don't know. I, I thought that we did this last month. We had a, is this, just, you're just reallocating it from a different area then? Right? Yeah. What we asked you to consider last month was asking the legislature to give us some money to do this. And we voted no to do that. Right. So we're not asking the legislature to give any more money. So we've got to try to find a way. Uh, within the existing money we have to try to, again, mitigate the likelihood that there is a violation of test security because of all the things I, I mentioned. Okay. Michelle, I think your points are very valid. There, there are punitive um, measures that happen if someone does violate that. It is illegal to post those questions, but if it happens, we need to be prepared. Is, I think, where this is headed. Um, Dennis. You were next. You got your answer? Okay. All right. Any further discussion? May I have a motion for item E? Dina? So moved. Is there a second? Betty? All in favor? Raise your hand. Opposed? Abstain. So that's a 9-0-1. Motion passes. And next we have item P, act on ESSER 3 change requests for use of federal COVID-19 relief funds. The, uh, I'll take that one. Thank you. The uh, task force meet, met last Friday. Uh, this is just one item. If you notice that instead of hundreds of pages, you got five this time, uh, which uh, should have taken a lot, of, a lot less time to read. Uh, this is an issue with uh, Caney Valley. They have... Uh, uh, some uh, 
required some facilities that need uh, uh, well their superintendent is here tell us what it is Blake Uh, he, he's prepared because he needs this <laughs> yeah. money. Well, it uh, has been a long journey to get here, but we're at the point now where, again, the, the, the facility that we acquired is one that we have some really unique things planned for. And so this is simply a request to be able to start that remodel process and create some evidence-based practices that are going to really help our students and bring opportunities that we don't currently have within the district. And so that's kind of the proposal before. We had to go through the capital committee to get that approved, which was kind of the last hurdle, which was done. And then the, the task force reviewed that and sent the recommendation for you all to approve today. And so we're excited to kind of begin that and see something, again, that will be new to us. But it's, it's really an example of us being resourceful and, and getting and acquiring a nearly 14,000 square foot facility instead of building that, which would be much higher to create this, we have a space that we're gonna remodel and be able to accomplish those same goals um, for a much lower cost. And so that's kind of the, the proposal in front of, the, the, for, of you all today. And the uh, task force was not scheduled to meet uh, in September because this is time sensitive. Uh, we did meet for this issue. And that being said, I move that we approve item P on the consent agenda. For a second? Jim McNeese. All right, further discussion? Ann, I have you up. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what somebody had against poor little Caney Valley, but I'm here to stand up for Caney Valley today. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy. <laughs> the, she's asking about the dollar amount. It's in the report, which is It's in the included. report, yeah. Yeah, it's in the report. Dennis? Well, I'm just curious what, what you're going to do. I'm sorry I didn't actually read the, your proposal. but Yeah, so just, um, if you story. imagine, um, again, essentially what's a, it's a metal building. Um, it was uh, designed for some multiple purposes over the years, but um, it's, it's within, uh, you know, eyesight of, in between our high school facility and our elementary, which, again, the location is just prime for us right there off the highway. Um, but what we're looking at is remodeling that into kind of some quadrants and looking at expanding CTE opportunities. We're going to be able to bring in some conference style rooms as well for use. Uh, we envision being able to bring in, uh, currently we partner with our local hospital and, and some of our mental health organizations to be, be able to provide opportunities for families to come in on a volunteer basis if they have already. Um, and again, from a privacy standpoint, so instead of having to come into the school for these services that are already occurring, uh, and maybe weeding through a volleyball game or activities that are going on. Now we have a, a, an area that's a little more private for them to be able to come into. Um, but we'll see all sorts of activities. So again, just large space where we can do, we envision, uh, you know, maybe science projects that are being able to be built. So instead of having to put those away or hide them, now they can stay out and be able to be worked on throughout. We envision just lots of opportunities in this in this area. And, and really that's what's unique about it as we talk and we started this vision um, our focus, based on what the state board has talked about, is you know each we talk about the success of each student. Ours is every student every day, and so this facility is designed to meet that. And so we're looking at, at you know what can we do in there. So uh, we're, we're partnering, hopefully, with the college. They brought in CDL um, for as one example of something that we're going to be able to look at with it being a large area, three and a half acres that has a parking lot, can we start some of that training here on site? And so not just Caney Valley students that could potentially be impacted, but other area students that could potentially come over and start some of this work as well. So hands-on learning experiences, all those things that we know are very good for students. We're looking at expanding those opportunities there on site. And I think you did very good for being blindsided. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't see any more questions. Last call, Dennis. What, what, what is your enrollment? I'm just curious. Uh, we're just a little under 800. And okay. so we've been one that we've been so, um, so. kind of plateaued and, and we're proud because as other rural districts have started to decline, we've been able to study that and start to see some growth. And so um, for us, this is just that next piece. We, we definitely are one that pride ourselves in bringing area students around for providing those opportunities. And this is just another area that we feel is gonna help us continue to, to stay grounded and, and one that keeps us on the map. All right, okay, thank you. Are we ready to vote? Okay, all in favor, raise your hand.
opposed? Abstain. 901, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. That is the end of the consent agenda. I'll move on to the chair report. And I just have a couple of things. Um, I want to call out, I, I said it yesterday, but I'll say it again. The annual conference for KSDE is coming up at the end of October. It's October 25th through 27th, which is Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, there's a website. You can see the whole agenda there. It will be in Wichita. Um, but depth of knowledge was something that came up a couple of times yesterday, and it was the piece that stood out for me as this is something that I was able to learn a lot more about at that conference. And so I just want to encourage board members to attend. Um, it's a good way to decode a lot of the acronyms and the abbreviations that we hear. Um, plus, it's a good opportunity just to talk with educators, and I've seen um, local board members at the conference. Um, so it's, it's a well-attended event, and I strongly encourage you all to be there. Um, the other thing I love about the conference is that, you know, students are at the core of everything we do, and it's 100% student-centric. It is all about what are we doing for students. Uh, Randy Watson will also be a keynote speaker on Friday. Can't miss that. Can't miss that. <laughs> so if you would like to register, just let Michaela know, and she will take care of your registration. You don't have to fill out the form online. The other thing is I would like to, I, I have a, a late um, good, goodbye to Barbara. Our board secretary left us, and I just want to call out publicly um, a special thank you to Barbara Hughes. She's moved on to another step in her career, and we want to wish her the very best as she pursues a new position. Um, hers are big shoes to fill, and yesterday we asked Michaela, I don't think we asked, did we? We just told you, you're going to be the interim. <laughs> so... Thank you, Michaela Aldridge, for stepping in for your service. And just a big thank you to Barbara Hughes for all that she did for the board during her service. Um, it's a big lift. I know a lot happens, and we don't see most of it. So thank you, both of you, for all that you do. And of course, this is extra work for Michaela because she already serves in the same capacity in the commissioner's office. And so she's taking on both, which is a lot. Um, so lots of gratitude for your service and your time. Thank you. And thank you, Barbara. Um, I promised you a call. We were, we were going to try to have dinner with Barbara, and it didn't work out this month, so hopefully we can do that next month. So with that, um, oh, got the wrong page of the agenda. We have action on the National Association of State Boards of Education 2024 dues. The NASB dues are in your packet. Are there any questions or discussion on that item before we vote? Dina. I don't have any questions. It's a great organization, and I would just like to make a motion. I move Kent State Board of Education approved the National Association of State Boards of Education dues for 2024. Is there a second? Betty. Any additional discussion or questions? All in favor? Oh. I just want, uh, can you just do a quick itemization of what the dues actually do for us as a board here that would be an advantage the, for us to be the membership. The dues essentially give us access to the organization. Um, okay. And so, it, Dina, you've been serving. We've had several. Jim was the chair of NASB. Jim was chair. Um, okay. <laughs> Jim, would okay, you Jim. like to say a few words about what <clears throat> NASB does for the board? On several different <laughs> levels, <clears throat> most of which are unseen by us as we sit here at the board, um, NASB is, is represents uh, and brings together uh, state board members um, in collaboration, if you will, to uh, represent us at the national level, to uh, provide us um, the option, if you wish, to learn about how to be a better board member. Uh, they speak and represent us in terms of, when I say us, uh, board members and uh, the states that we represent and the states we represent in a way that uh, uh, we're a part of the national conversation and national agenda and have a voice in what happens and 
whether it's Congress or whether it's uh, the Department of Education or associations across the United States, from superintendents to teachers to, it's, it's a voice for us that, uh, as I said before, you don't see as you sit here. You know, if you were to take that away, you probably wouldn't see anything happen dramatically. The dam wouldn't break. But eventually, um, I think you'd see a, a lack of, of uh, consistency and continuity of support and recognition for uh, what happens at state boards. Um, you know, on the other hand, uh, the NASB will be as, as much as you participate, a, uh, a resource for you as a, as a board member. Um, obviously, they have all kinds of services and, knowledge, uh, and, and resources available at, the, at, at your beck and call. You know, if you're not using it, um, then probably, as I've said to other boards around the nation, you know, there's two parts to that. One, we need to do a better job telling you, and you do a better job asking. So, you know, um, I personally, as a board member and as a um, um, representing the state of Kansas, I've had the honor to be on uh, to be the president of NASB, to uh, speak at other states, to uh, um, be a representative for uh, state board members, and that's what they do. That's that's their job. They're they're there to serve us. It's kind of like USA, United School Administrators. It's like um, KSP, Kansas Association of of uh, Principals. <clears throat> you know. Um, and the services they provide many times, as I said, you know, it's hard because it's not like in your face and they're, they're there when you need them, but they're also working for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, uh, and they're there to, uh, to help us when we need it. And they have over the years um, certainly helped us with policy and, and uh, uh, dealing with issues. I know, so it's... it's um, to me, it's it's a real benefit for uh, our state. It's a real benefit for our for you as board members, but it's also a benefit for the Department of Ed, and it's a benefit for uh, the practitioners that we serve in the state of Kansas. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that Jim just said. Um, I would point out to all the board members there are multiple conferences and opportunities for you to get involved with NASB. So if you haven't had an opportunity to do so yet. I'm happy to help connect you. Um, you can go to the website and learn all about them and, and when those opportunities are and where they're happening. Uh, when I joined the board, everything was remote, and now they've gone back to having some in-person things. So their annual conference will be, this year, their annual conference is coming up in October. You can still sign up to go to that. San Diego. In San Diego, yep. And then um, there's an annual legislative conference, which I attended this spring. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the things that they did for those of us that attended that conference is they helped set up visits with our representatives in Congress. And so I didn't even have to ask. They just said, you know, do you want to do this, yes or no? And I said, yes. And so they set up the meetings. It was great to have somebody just organizing all of that and making sure that we got where we were supposed to be at, at the appropriate time. Um, they are a wealth of knowledge. Um, their new member institute happens, I believe, more than once a year. It's a couple of times a year. And then you kind of have a cohort of people. You, you get to meet people from other states. And I think that's been the biggest advantage for me, is getting to talk <coughs> with board members from all around the country and learning about how they're doing things in their states, because we're all so different. And so it's just been a really unique opportunity to learn about how boards are, how, they, how their policies are different, how their oversight is different. Some are appointed, some are elected. Um, so I, I can't say enough great things about NASB. Um, they've been a fantastic support for me. And I'll just reiterate, that the, the, if you guys, if the newbies haven't been to the new member thing, go, because you'll get ideas, you'll meet people from all across the country. It's, it's really valuable. The, con the national conference, I've only been once, but got a lot of good ideas. Then we have, of course, the NASB standard, the magazine, which will give you a deep dive into a particular topic. But, um, and the research that's available is really cool, too. But you may be getting an email you're not even recognizing about NASB office hours just about every week. They'll have um, an online Zoom where they'll dig into um, a particular topic. Like I remember one week it was assessments. And so national board members from all across the country were on there talking about what do we do with state assessments? And I'm thinking, you know, it's great ideas. So just 
like Jim said, many, many levels and well worth the money. So, Jim Porter. The that new member workshop was just great, uh, and you, and you, one of the things about anything anything when you're joining other groups is 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 the networking. I know that I still talk to one of the people from another state that. Uh, that was in the same group I was as a new member workshop, but that's not the reason I signed up here. Uh, I at one time was the chairman of their uh, government relations committee. And the government relations committee meets uh, once a month, especially whenever the, leg the, the federal legislation is session, and it gives us up-to-date information of the educational issues that are being, f being addressed and gives us opportunities to be able to express our opinion if we have them uh, at the national level. And I found that to be very, uh, very valuable information for this board to have. Dina? And <clears throat> Melanie mentioned I've served on committees <coughs> for several years yeah. and one that I been serving on the last few years is called the PEP Committee, which is the Public Education Policy Committee. And that's the committee that kind of sets up the concerns that all of the people <coughs> across the nation have that is the same as what we're experiencing, they're experiencing it too, and we're developing the policy that goes along with that so we can work with it from the Governmental Affairs Committee, and it also deals with some of it, <clears throat> excuse me, from, I think we both have our allergy issues, but anyway, um, the PEP committee also deals with setting up ideas for the state wards also to follow. So um, I found it to be very valuable because of that arena. And I also served, had the opportunity to, to attend the uh, new, new board <coughs> members conference also. And people that I met at that point, you continue to see them at meetings and on committees and you, have a camaraderie and a relationship with folks from across the nation that is incredibly valuable. Don't see any more comments. Any further questions? I have a motion. Oh wait, we have a motion. We are ready to vote. Okay, all in favor, raise your hand. That is 10 0. Motion passes. Thank you. And Dennis, when, when you do finally get involved, maybe you can get them to give you the special experience of getting stuck in an elevator with eight of your fellow NASB members. It's a team building opportunity. I'm pretty sure they planned it, um, but I did get to spend some time in an elevator with them, and they're wonderful people. <laughs> You'll pass. <laughs> All right, um, next up we have board travel. Are there any changes? You've got a, a page in your packet for board travel. Anne? Uh, just a couple of date changes, Michaela, from what I gave you, that um, the next uh, school improvement meeting has been changed from September 21st to the 26th. And then on the um, education conference, I'll be there the 26th and 27th. Dina? I have a um, annual meeting of the Kansas Foundation for Excellence in Education <coughs> on September 28th. Jim Porter? No, you're good. 
Um, and I have one addition. Uh, the NASB finance meeting is on September 19th. And then I think you have Jim and I down. Um, we're going to go to the KBOR meeting as well. Okay. Any other additions <coughs> to travel? Motion to approve. Jim? Second? Jim? All in favor? Raise your hand. That's 10 0. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, next up, committee reports. Do we have anyone with a committee report to give? Anne? Thank you. I apologize. I didn't get this put together before the board meeting where we just met last Friday, but I wanted to give you a little update. The Kansas Advisory Council on Indigenous Education, the working group, um, met. We took the summer off, but there's been so much. I just want to let you guys know, I think forming this um, council has been so valuable. It's just bringing together a lot of people who have um, interest in um, Native American student education, and we're, we're doing a lot of really good things. Uh, one thing is we're trying to figure out a way to get better data on just where uh, Native American students are and what tribes they belong to. Um, I know that uh, there are a lot of resources available to these kiddos, and we, they can't get them if, if the people who have the resources don't know where they are. But the bigger picture is it's really given us a valuable opportunity to build a government-to-government -government relationship. A lot of people don't realize the four tribes that we have in Kansas are um, sovereign nations, you know, and they are governments. And they have an opportunity, have asked, reached out to us and asked to work with us as a government to government uh, entities to help um, these students because more than 90% of them aren't on um, Indian tribal land. They, they live somewhere else and they, or they go to public schools and not the Indian schools. So it's a real opportunity to bring together some things. Uh, one of the things that came up. Um, that's going to happen in November is there's going to be a middle school um, conference, Native American student conference over in Lawrence. And to start, we're going to have the Lawrence School District, Topeka, and the Royal Valley School District coming together. They have speakers coming in. It's going to be a really cool event for, for middle school students. Hope to maybe expand that next year. Um, also, there's um, if you have time on October 9th, there's Indigenous um, education Day or Indigenous Peoples Day at K-State, which is an amazing event. If you uh, want to go to that, it's free. I can get you more information about it. Um, and also, another thing, interesting thing that's happened is um, there's always a spillover from K-12 to post-secondary. And so KBOR has a representative on our um, council. And uh, as we move toward maybe making moving this from a working group to a permanent group, KBOR is asked to be involved, that this advisory council advise both KBOR and us on issues that, that we have in common. So it's very exciting stuff going on. Um, and so I'll, do, I'll write that up and send it to you so you have a little more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Any other committee reports? Okay. And as always, you can put an individual report in the packet. Uh, just send it to Michaela, and she'll make sure that we get a copy, and you should have one of those noted this month. And next up we have Mark with the board attorney report. Thank you, Madam Chair. A few things to um, uh, cover this month. Uh, they're, they're the first would just be your, my monthly report, always open to questions on that that gets submitted. That summarize uh, the activities of the prior month. Um, one of the projects that I've had the um, opportunity to work on for the School for the Deaf and the School for the Blind relate to the hiring of a SRO officer for both schools. Um, the legislature um, allocated some money, some additional funds for both schools to have an SRO officer. And so uh, I was involved in helping coordinate an interlocal agreement uh, between each of the schools, the community police department, and the uh, and the uh, government. So you have three uh, three parties involved. So, for example, unified government in Wyandotte County, the uh, Kansas City, Kansas Police, and the school for um, for the blind would all enter into an agreement to establish um, 
to have an SRO officer in place uh, on on that campus, and the same is true with the school for the uh, school for the deaf. Um, so part of that was just coordinating um, and working with legal counsel for each of those. Didn't take a ton of time, but it did take some follow up to kind of get get that timely implemented before uh, or in conjunction with the beginning of the of the semester. Um, they both wanted to get that done and certainly didn't want to re report back to the legislature that the money wasn't used um, because we weren't able to get that in place. I asked Luann and John to provide an update um, and I thought that the uh, SRO would be worthy of, of kind of reporting to you the caliber of person that is um, has been uh, put in place as an SRO officer. Uh, Luann reports that uh, the SRO, SRO officer, Jamie Schmidt, has worked as a police officer since 2000. She uh, started her career in a small town in western Kansas. She's been employed by the city of Olathe since uh, 2011. Um, she has worked for eight and a half years uh, as an SRO officer with the Olathe School District. Uh, she's worked in four middle schools and the alternative high school. She graduated from Fort Hayes State University in 1999 and started her career as a juvenile detention officer before becoming a police officer. Uh, officer Schmidt began working as a school resource officer because of her passion to work with children and to build a better relationship between students and law enforcement. Uh, officer Schmidt started in May uh, and the agreement has been executed to, to, uh, to pay her um, she's not an employee of the school. She's an independent contractor. Um, I thought it was uh, very unique and wonderful that she has been taking ASL classes uh, regularly and is learning uh, real quickly, according to Luann. She's able to use ASL with the staff and students. Um, she's participated in, uh, build in a workshop for staff um, and explain the role of an SRO officer and school administrators, and they're working to build relationships in the community. And I'm sure you're familiar with the role of an SRO officer in other other uh, districts and other uh, school buildings, and they've been uh, instrumental in in uh, building those relationships. So there, uh, we have that as a as a uh, asset for the school for the deaf. That the, both schools are also working to secure additional security positions for the second and third shift. So these are the primary uh, SRO uh, personnel during the day, but they're still in the process of trying to uh, secure um, additional personnel through vendors or third parties to enter, in, enter into contracts for uh, overnight security. Um, John Harding, um, uh, indicated that the the memorandum of understanding has been signed. They've uh, retained or been assigned Officer Dave Mitchell. He's going to be starting this week. He's been uh, he is a 13 year veteran of the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. He's primarily working during s the hours of 7 and 3 p.m. Uh, he's gone through orientation. He's um, helping with safety assessments on the campus. Doing a public relations work with the community and 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 engaged in training with kids and staff. Um, it seems very likable. Uh, they've responded well to him um, uh, to him already, and uh, so those are the kind of fun legal projects that I get to assist the School for the Deaf and the School for the Blind on documenting the roles and responsibilities um, between the the uh, three um, governmental agencies, and then. Um, get, seeing that that money is wisely used for an SRO officer for each of those campuses, and that's something they've been working on for a long time. Um, the, I just, it, through my various uh, either reading of court opinions or keeping up on uh, current events uh, in the law, there's sometimes just uh, opinions jump out at me, this, there's one that just came out in August, middle of August, of, uh, from the Supreme Court of Missouri, and I'd never really seen anything quite like it, but they, 
there was a, uh, some parents were convicted of um, violating the Missouri compulsory attendance laws, and I had never seen anything like that where somebody had actually um, been prosecuted for, um, be because they did not meet the minimum uh, requirements. And we, we talk about how if a challenge is made to a law in, in Missouri or Kansas, and, it's, and the challenge is based on unconstitutionality, it's not something that would start in the district court and then work its way up to the Supreme Court. Um, challenges of a law based on unconstitutionality, um, whether it's you know too vague or whether it, it violates certain rights, they go. Those are legal actions that start with the Supreme Court. So uh, in Missouri, uh, these two uh, parents were convicted of failing to cause their children to attend school on a regular basis in violation of the Missouri compulsory attendance law. And uh, um, the, probably no surprise, but the Supreme Court found that that was, uh, that was constitutional. Um, it, it's just that you, you can go you know, 20 years in an area and never have something get uh, challenged. And I just thought it was interesting. I'm not aware of any Kansas cases that they've, they've uh, prosecuted or challenged the compulsory attendance laws in the state of Kansas. But that was one that just popped up on my radar last, uh, last month that I thought it was, it was good. Um, curious enough to raise that, that that's, uh, that's been uh, validated and uh, passed the constitutional uh, test in, in, uh, in Missouri. Um, it just seems like, I feel like I could go on for an hour about different current events that have been popping up, at least in the eastern region of the, of the state that have some, <coughs> some um, impact or, or commonality to the issues that uh, you deal with at this board, whether it be Open Meetings Act, o Open Records Act, districts being hit with um, opinions related to special ed financing and funding and those kinds of things. But one that caught my attention has to do with the Johnson County Commissioners and, and a challenge that is now before the Kansas Attorney General, at least it's been, uh, I don't know if it's how widely published it is, but it, it's been written about quite a bit in, in my area because it involves the Johnson County Commissioners. And as you know, the Open Meetings Act and the Open Records Act apply to all governmental entities. And so we uh, talk about, you know, the ability to go into executive session to discuss certain matters. And the general rule is that meetings are open unless there's a limited um, reason to go into an executive session or a closed session. And uh, in this particular case, the challenge related to uh, an executive session for personnel matters. And um, just a, using this as an example to discuss that particular issue. Uh, as I understand the, the reporting, the issue had to, has to do with going into, it, going into an executive session for the stated purpose of uh, discussing personnel matters. Um, where that becomes, where that line becomes a little bit blurry is that you can't go into executive session to discuss um, perhaps the economics of a budget or general discussion about finances and, you know, the raises that you might um, give to an entire category or department or, the, or all, because those are matters of public concern and if it has to do with general finances or mill levy or, or you know, what you need to be able to retain, attract and retain employees on a generic or general level, then that's something that needs to, that, that discourse needs to happen in public. And you, you know, that's the, that's the debate that occurs. However, if you are wanting to talk about an individual uh, employee, you do have the right to go into an executive session to discuss an individual employee to protect the privacy rights of that individual. So if you're negotiating a contract or if you're talking about discipline or if you're talking about pay raises, 
of an individual employee, then you do have that right. And go back to the theme that it's sometimes those are blurry because when you get behind, you know, when you when you go into a, an executive session, it's just natural to have a conversation and evolve. And so that's you know I try to perk my ears up when we talk about those things or in representing other other uh, clients because it can you can easily gravitate from one topic to another and then after the fact you've got ten people here who might have a disagreement about issue and that's what happened in this case I don't know that there's been a, a finding but it's a real pain in the backside because then the district attorney or the in this case the attorney general has to get involved take statements and understand what happened what was the purpose but in at least as it's publicly reported uh, the there is a discussion not only about the general budget and you know re attracting and retaining uh, employees, but there was a specific discussion about individuals, high-level people that, you know, they needed to retain, and so you kind of get, um, you get both in that discussion, so you have to be really careful about that, but I, but there have been over the years uh, many times when uh, districts or public entities can get in trouble if they're going to try to go into executive session just for the purpose of discussing budgetary issues and if you're if it's just talking about money then the money is something that's a matter of public concern that would be you know discussed and debated and open uh, but you do have the right to go into an executive session you know and for example if you talk about um, when you do you know reviews or things like that uh, addressing the commissioner or if you you know employee of the board or in, in other public entities uh, would have more employees to discuss on an individualized basis. Did you have a question on that? There is a question on that. Danny? Thank you. So I thought, I thought forever that there was real specific things that a school board and a state board can go into executive session for. for if you're going to use talk about a particular person, and I can't remember the other couple things. But it's always been real specific about what you can go in executive session for. Good point. Am I wrong on that? No, you're right. The, it, so the general rule is open unless there's a specific narrow exception. But and there's not just two or three. If you look at the at the if you look at the exceptions, I think there's like 27 exceptions. Not very many of them would apply to a to a school district, but they might apply to a public entity. So there's, you know, criminal exceptions. If, for example, if you're at school district and you're going to go into a discussion about purchasing land, for example, you know, because you need to protect the, the, the negotiation price. So there are some, uh, approximately 25 specific exceptions. The top three or four that would apply to a school district or would apply to the state board would be attorney-client privilege communications, and it has to be with your attorney, and it has to be for the purpose of giving legal advice. So you can't just cloak it as attorney-client privilege, invite the attorney into the room. You have to be engaged in discussion about things that should be protected that, from an attorney-client standpoint. Um, the second, and probably more likely for a school board would be, uh, would be personnel matters negotiation of a contract with a superintendent, discipline for an employee or, or you know, raises, things like that. So those are, those are the primary uh, ones that are used, but there are many more that can come into play. Uh, for certainly collective bargaining is, an except, is a narrow exception if you're wanting to, you know, protect the, the uh, conversation about a bargaining. But, uh, that's in a in a broad brush way. Those are the the, the general categories. Other questions on that? Well, the last thing is kind of a, I guess, a bigger one um, that I've tried to make it a point to. I guess the last several months to maybe just focus on an area of the law or a statute or something that is um, 
is is just worthy of of um, bringing up, raising, or having a discussion about. I don't have any creative ways uh, this month to uh, uh, to you know to cr tell you that I've uh, written a, written a uh, regulation and and see if you agree with it. But I I am constantly, even though I'm uh, I, I'm here listening, you know, intently on the different topics uh, that the board has to wrestle with. And while there may be a divergence of opinion on a specific item, um, I think it's helpful to, to take a moment to focus and reflect on the law that codifies what we call the Rose capacity standards. Because, because the if you look at the language, I mean, it, it, it's a little bit of a, of a springboard from what we talked about last month in, in that we, certain board members I hear talk about, you know, the reading and the, and the you know, the, the certain things that are, um, you know, considered traditional or core areas of uh, subjects of, uh, or areas of instruction. But um, I think it's helpful too to see the kind of alignment with what is required on the Rose Capacity Standard and revisit some of the language that's presented because it's these are mandatory subjects and areas of instruction. And um, and in and, and the these uh, the heading here it it sets out and refers to other subjects uh, that uh, are dictated and required by statute. So the 3214 has to do with subjects in elementary school. 3217 has to do with graduation requirements. Uh, 3232 has to do with community service. 3235 has to do with history and government. And 3236 has to do with personal financial liter uh, literacy. So it's saying in addition to those other statutes that are involved, Every accredited high school in the state of Kansas shall teach the subjects and areas of instruction necessary to meet the graduation requirements adopted by the State Board of Education. And, you know, when I read cases, um, even though it seems uh, obvious or intuitive, you know, the first thing that the courts typically do is look at the language and say, is it shall, is it may, is it, is it permissive or is it mandatory? And you know the one thing that jumps out at me, and in this uh, in this particular statute, is um, is that it's mandatory. It's shall. It doesn't say. It doesn't really give you the. It does. It gives you some <laughs> options within each subdivision. So, for example, um, it's you know it says or in in some of these provisions. It says um, you know. Subpart so four, sufficient self-knowledge and knowledge of his or her mental or physical wellness. There's others, um, for example, in academics or in the job market. So it balances both vocational, educational, and the and academics. But if you go through C one through seven, and I'll just highlight the, the key phrases, um, the following capacities, which um, are uh, synonymous with Rose capacities, the legislature um, in, in uh, 2013 uh, changed the statute so that um, the, the legislature dictated that the following capacities shall be uh, designed by the State Board of Education and shall uh, be a goal for education in the state of Kansas. Sufficient oral and written communication skills to enable students to function in a complex and rapidly changing civilization. Uh, two, sufficient knowledge of economic, social, and political systems to enable the students to make informed choices. Three, sufficient understanding of governmental processes to enable the student to understand the issues that affect his or her community, state, and nation. And I, we heard some conversation around the table about what was global, what was, you know, state, what was specific. So I'm not advocating for a particular position or trying to trying to debate anybody about a position that's taken. I just think sometimes it's helpful for me 
to put some of the conversation that occurs around the table in the context. And I don't think it's debatable that in, in this particular statute, um, the legislature has said that the State Board of Education shall teach subjects that um, provide for a sufficient un understanding of governmental processes to enable the student to understand the issues that affect his or her community, state, and nation. Um, so multiple levels. Uh, four, sufficient self-knowledge uh, and knowledge of his or her mental and physical wellness. Five, sufficient grounding in the arts to enable each student to appreciate his or her cultural and historical heritage. Six, sufficient training or preparation for advanced training in either academic or vocational fields so as to enable each child to choose and pursue life work intelligently. And seven, sufficient levels of academic or vocational skills to enable public school students to compete favorably with their counterparts in surrounding states, in academics, or in the job market. So um, I, obviously, as policymakers, you decide whether or not you feel like the things that you are on the agenda and the things that you're making decisions about fall within those categories, but um, those are the things that at least the legislature has mandated um, are to be uh, topics. And I imagine since we talk about school finance being reworked in the coming years, um, uh, another reason I think to, to highlight and reinforce the terms and the phrases that are, that are uh, used to judge the work of of education in the state of Kansas, and thanks for allowing me to editorialize a little bit. Thank you, Mark. Um, thanks for the updates, and thanks also for the reminders. I think it's nice to have those reminders, and it's nice to have a printed copy there. Last but not least, oh, Ann. Thank you. I just I really want to thank Mark for going over the rose capacities, because I'm if you haven't been around for a while, you don't know that actually came out of a court case, one of the campaign finance or the education finance uh, funding court cases. The rose capacities were, actually came out of a case, I think, in Kentucky. And the question was, what is it the state legislature is going to pay for? You know, we had one set of criteria before this, but out of the court case, they, they agreed these rose capacities would be what the legislature would pay for and what we would provide. So my question mark is, I'm in, I know we talked about the rose capacities a little bit in the um, school improvement group that, that Ben is, is uh, heading up. And my question to them was, doesn't our accreditation system, because it says all accredited schools, our accreditation system better check to make sure the schools are teaching the rose capacities. Would I be correct about that? You're saying that you want them to teach the, the rose capacities? Well, it, I mean, the, we, we, already, know, we already have that in our accreditation standards. Mm -hmm. if, if you go through the accreditation criteria that's on our website, one of them, uh, several of them refer back to, in fact, it's labeled, this came from the rose capacities, and that's why we accredit you on them. I just want to make sure that in the process of changing accreditation, trying to streamline it, we don't lose track of the fact that we actually have to accredit these things by law. Yes, and I guess my answer would be um, whether you use these specific phrases or you use syn synonymous terms, you yeah. know, in education, that's where it kind of, you know, to me, I think about, um, you know, self-knowledge and knowledge of his or her mental and physical wellness. I mean, you know, we we haven't used that specific phrase, but we've used that terminology as in terms of what the board priorities are and what, and what are, are important. So I don't know yeah. um, if, as long as, you're, as long as you're accrediting those concepts, those themes, I, I think. Yeah, that and that I think that's what we do. If you look at our criteria, we don't have like seven things listed out, but right. we have them maybe grouped together and so that we have all of the capacities covered in some way. Another homework if people want to go look to see. Dan. 
Are we done with this, or does anybody else have some? I'm questions? finished. Okay, it's does anybody else have any questions? I was going to move on to I, I want to ask a question. No. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. So what's, what's the protocol, you're, since you're the board attorney? So if I have a legal question, I ask you, or do I have to go through the chairman and vice chair be, before that's approved? How does, how does that work? Well, on a very large scale, I will tell you just from an economic standpoint, typically if it's something that's not urgent, I get questions from board members at meetings because I, I'm on a flat fee during my board meetings. So I typically, I'm always open to, if we're not in a, in a policy committee lunch, you know, get together and have lunch, talk about something uh, during a break, before or after. So I consider that part of my, my role. Uh, beyond that, um, you know, if it's something that's substantial, it typically would be approved by the board chair or the vice chair. Um, I have no problem having a conversation with anybody about any specific issue. Uh, I obviously look, I obviously represent the board as a whole. So if it's, uh, you know, if it's something that I think is going to require significant time or be broader, um, I would, you know, probably s seek permission to, to, to do something um, by the uh, board chair or the vice chair. Uh, that, I'm just saying that's a g very generic. I don't know what your question is, but beyond that, I would say uh, um, you can ask me any time or you can run it through the, the board chair because it really depends on the question, I guess. And, and I, I echo Mark's sentiments. He is cheaper for us right now because he's already in the room. And Betty, I'm, I'm going to put Betty on the spot here in a minute because while you stepped out, Danny asked a question about protocol when it comes to asking a question of our attorney. Should it go through Randy? Should it go through the chair? Should it go straight to Mark? And so um, I would just say, you know, to Mark's point, if it is something that's going to require a significant amount of effort, um, it would I would want to know about it as the chair, um, and, and Jim Porter should be included as the vice chair. But Betty, is it written in policy? Can I, can I put you on the spot for that answer? And you may have to reference the book. Actually, I've not seen anything in policy that, okay. <clears throat> that dictates that. But just from a general standpoint of having served on a local board, if there are general questions, um, you know, we always had the, op the option of going to the attorney. And if he felt like that was information that could be germane to the entire board, he had that option of sharing it. But we don't really have anything in policy that dictates how you can or cannot interact with uh, with the board attorney. You know, sometimes it's just a, a quick general question, and you wouldn't necessarily want to go through all of the steps if it is very general in nature. Danny, well, we, because Mark does charge outside of this meeting, so if it's a specific question, you know, just related to general, what's the law around this? You can always call me and I can confer with Scott Gordon. It doesn't cost anything to do that. If it's things that need to go to Mark, um, we generally run that through Jim and, and Melanie because there's going to be a cost associated with that. It's, it, it's a study. So uh, I'm happy to try to help if it's something that, you know, minor or related to general application of a general law. Our legal counsel can help with that outside of the meetings and lower the cost. And it, it so, really so depends that, specific on the specific question. If you if you came to me and said, I believe the board violated the Open Meetings Act when we went into executive session and talked about that, that's, you know, that's, that's pretty specific and something that you would bring to my attention and I would handle it way differently than if you just had a general question. So, so. basically I have to ask the chair or vice chair to get to Mark. I don't think that's at all what I said. That's not what I said, and that's not what she said. I think it depends on what the issue is. I mean, I've fielded questions during the, the report, yeah, and so it really depends. But when we break here, you, uh, you're you free. I'll, I'll wait around. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Danny, I, th I think it's kind of like travel. You know, the board approves travel. So what we're looking at is you have a budget and that could get blown out. If any board member said, Mark, I want you to, to do a legal analysis of X, 
and Mark says that's going to take me 20 hours to do. I think other people would want to weigh in on the, what the expenditure of that money. So it's not a question per se. It would be, that's kind of the balance of it. Danny, you good? Okay. We will move on to item F, requests for future agenda items. Are there any requests? Dennis? I, I really appreciate the uh, presentation on mental health uh, yesterday. I would like for us to uh, consider having her come back at least once a school year and give us updates because this is, you know, in relationship to what kids experience were, and it was all about the screen time and stuff and how that's affecting them. I think it'd be good for us to, uh, she's in touch with the counselors and and uh, knows kind of what's going on on the ground. If, if we would get a report from her at least one, one school year, maybe twice a year, just to see how our kids are doing. Check in on that was very good. Thank you, Dennis. Anyone else? Got two. Kathy? Oh, go ahead. Mine's actually not too big on that. Um, Anne? This is future agenda. Yeah. Well, just follow up on Danny or Dennis said, I think, you know, knowing what's going on with the mental health pilot um, would be helpful. I don't think a lot of us understand, and I learned a lot in the hearings last year when they were talking about adding money to it, just exactly what they're providing with that and how valuable it is to the schools. And there's probably a lot of misunderstanding about it, too. So to do that. And then I think uh, we ought to have a report uh, now that the survey is back on what schools are doing with firearm safety, uh, just to report back out on that so we can see if we need to change anything or, or not change anything, um, get ready for the legislative session. And another one, I'm not quite sure how to put it. I probably got more feedback on our vote um, on the homeless kids' education last month than anything we've done in the last couple of years. And it, it really scares me that we came so close to denying homeless kids some very much needed services they wouldn't get anywhere. There's no church school that does IEPs and transportation and all that stuff. And the whole thing was, I mean, it's not our job to, in that particular case to solve the homeless problem. That's not what we were voting on. We were voting on our legal obligation to provide the same equitable education to homeless kids that we do every other kid. That's what we were voting on. And if one of the six of us hadn't been here, it scares me to death to think the services that would have been denied to kids who are so fragile anyway. So, I mean, we have a lot of, here's, here's my question. We have a lot of six, four votes that seem to be tied to federal funding or federal issues. And so many times, I mean, if one of the six of us was gone, I hate to think what kids would be denied. And I just want to understand what it is um, as a board we would support, I guess, with federal money and what we don't. And so I can understand better what the issue is, because I really didn't get that vote last month. So that's it. Maybe a future agenda item on federal funding and education, where it goes, how we use it, that kind of thing. Thank, Thank you. you, Anne. Betty. Actually, that's a <clears throat> great opportunity. I have to weigh in on what Anne was saying <clears throat> because I, I was approached by um, also an individual uh, that serves in the school, and, and she was sharing with me. But, Betty, sorry to interrupt you. This is future agenda item, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And she was sharing with me the same kind of issue. So I am just adding on to what she's saying. I think it really, it really would be great. The, the other thing that I'm kind of wondering is tying in, um, I don't know, our perspective in terms of who it is that we're really looking to serve. I don't know if all of that can be wrapped in together, but um, it we was only brought. Have two days for the meeting, Betty. Two days. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It, it was brought to my attention, and I just wanted to echo that. That um, there are a lot of people that are really concerned about those issues. Thank you. I, I will do my best in my notes to do that justice. Thank you. All right. Any other future agenda items, Michelle? 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess um, a couple things were brought up today and yesterday, uh, just the understanding of public private partnerships and what that means and does those, do those people in the Department of Education understand what that is? When they're talking about that um, and, and just, just throwing that out there in general conver like conversations when they're doing presentations, does the community, uh, does, does Kansas, do the legislature, I think, I think people need to understand what that is and, and, um, and what that does to representative government, what that does to the Republic of the United States. And when you're talking global, you talked about state, local, and nation. We're a nation. Um, we're not. We're not a. Glo we're not a global entity. It's. A, it's a. The republic is a republic for a reason. And I think we need to understand what public-private partnerships are. And I think you'll find out um, if you do a thing on federal government and you do a thing on public-private partnerships. That would be a. That would be awesome to be able to bring in people to discuss that that know the research and the history behind that. And and I would be all for that. I would love that because you, then you'll find out maybe why I do the research that I do and I come in and I pull things and I vote against things. It would take me a long time. I'm, I'm trying to even get through the legislat certain legislatures, legislation on this. When they're voting for things, reading a, uh, reading a bill and then really reading a bill and understanding the and a, uh, when you're talking about the right and a uh right, they're, they're wanting to right now give us 10 specific rights uh, for a parent for education. And I'm like, no, I have the ultimate right. I have an unalienable right under God, and, and I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, those, those preceded government. And I think we're losing the fact that we're understanding, they don't understand the Constitution and what, what our rights are. And, and so I wanna make sure we understand that when I'm t we're talking about certain things. Sometimes you don't have the right to give that money. It, it's not money, it's not yours to give. And so you have to look at, how does that actually harm a student? Or, okay, if you're gonna bring that federal money in to a school, I have the right to opt out of those services. If it's SEL and it's, and it's on an adaptive computer thing, no, I'm gonna see, I don't wanna see an assessment uh, being done on my kid. I wanna see test scores, quizzes. I wanna see actual assignments. I wanna see what they're learning in real time and not adaptively giving, you're, you're taking a test and assessment and I'm taking assessment. I answered a question one way, I gotta go all the way around to get the same question and answer and outcome that that kid next to me is getting. You may say that's not happening, but I can tell you it is happening because I have a kid in the school district and I can tell you how they're answering the questions and why they're answering them the way they do on those assessments or on those tests that are adaptive. And we're not seeing that as a parent unless we're asking for that or being informed of that. And so that's why more and more parents are saying, I want, I want sheets, I want paperwork, I want them to type up their um, um, re reports or their uh, uh, papers, because you used to, all that stuff used to come home. It doesn't come home anymore. Um, it may or may not, unless you ask for that specifically, or you're opening up and you're seeing exactly and getting on Canvas or whatever it is, what that child is seeing. So be happy to, to, to have that come up as a future agenda item. I think it would be very eye-opening. I want to make sure I write down the right thing. So I heard public-private partnerships but there's also, do you want to talk about ass testing and assessments separately? Sure, sure. You can get them out now. Do you want to try to get them out real quickly? Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other future agenda items? Kathy? Well, it's actually not a future agenda item. I'm actually seeking some clarification, if I may. Can I do that now? It's, it's over yesterday's meeting. I'll allow it this once. Thank you, um, I really appreciate that. Sure. Um, as I reflected on yesterday's board meeting, I really am seeking clarification of the board um, attorney's role and duties within this board and, and the meetings. Um, when I looked at board policy, what I saw was that he shall attend all meetings and render legal services when requested. What I felt happened here yesterday is that he took over the meeting in that he shut down conversation and discussion that this board was having. And I do, do not see that as his role. So I wanna make sure I understand and I couldn't get my hands on the contract within the time frame, but per policy, I certainly don't see that being the role of a board attorney within an elected board. So I just wanted to ask you, Madam Chair, if you could help me understand that particular uh, capacity of a board attorney and also exactly what 
parliamentary rules, Robert's Rule of Orders, what do we actually run by so that I can get a better grasp on those kinds of things? Because I honestly don't know. Okay. So thank you. I heard you. a couple of different things there that may that is likely a future agenda item. I do have an opinion, but I will reserve it because this isn't the time for discussion. And then the last piece of that, um, you serve on the policy committee. So you can certainly you know, discuss with the committee um, where that fits in board policy. So to, to say essentially, um, hopefully you can help me answer the last part of your question uh, through the policy book. All right. Any other future agenda items? If not, I will see you all back here next month. <laughs> we are adjourned.